And we're live. Woo! Welcome, YouTube, the world, people of Earth to the 2021 Virtual Fisher Poets. I'm your MC for the six o'clock to 7.30, uh, 90 minute slot. My name is Mo Baustern. And uh, I'm coming to you live from my living room on Chinook lands here uh, where the Willamette and the Columbia come together. We are so excited to be trying something new for real. And um, I just want to say starting out like how proud I am of the Fisher Poets, unlike the Olympics and many uh, other large groups around the world who are continuing to gather for trying something new and figuring stuff out. And I just think it really speaks to the nature of people who work so closely with an unpredictable partner such as the ocean that we always have to try something new even when it's terrifying. And believe me, it's been terrifying for some of us. So. I'm just so proud of everyone. I'm proud of everybody who's joining in on YouTube. We're so excited to be able to share what we're doing across the globe um, and across town. So thank you so much. And we have a few announcements as always to start things off. Um, I don't even know what year this is. We've been doing this since uh, 1998, the last weekend of February and we have three nights of reading. You're on night two, two sets per night. So we're going to go until 7.30 tonight and, uh, with me. And then we have a little break. And then we'll be back at eight with Alma Burnham as your MC with another group of performers. Tomorrow night will be the last night of the 2021 <laughs> Virtual Fisher Poets. We have a website, fisherpoets.org, which you can explore and find all kinds of offerings that I'll be telling you throughout. We have um, our first performers are the Browns Meet Flats, an acoustic music group that we have grown to love. They've been part of Fisher Poets since the very beginning. They like to say they uh, perform crabgrass, which is maritime bluegrass. Many of their songs are composed by the members of the group and reflect on living in the Pacific Northwest. And for those of you that don't know, Brownsmead Flats is an area of the Columbia River just east of Astoria. And um, you can't, it's, you're basically living, the, the houses are on stilts. You think you're in the water, <laughs> you're above the water. So that, yeah, here's Ned to start us off. And I think, Ned, do you have, you have a new poem for us tonight? Is that right? And then you're gonna share a video of your, of the Browns Mean Flats. So take it away, Ned. Okay. Yeah, let me do my poem. I, uh, first of all, I wanted to say uh, last night was incredible and I couldn't sleep. I needed to write something, all the wonderful words I heard. So uh, in my, uh, 20s, I did a, quite a bit of uh, commercial fishing for tuna uh, between Baja California and the Dixon entrance in Alaska. And uh, here's a poem I wrote last night called Lengua Salada, Salty Tongue. In high school in Michigan, I studied French. A few years later, I stood on the flying bridge of a tuna boat home ported in San Diego, heading south down the Baja coast with a crew of Mexican fishermen recently boarded in Ensenada. For the next 30 days, we fished for yellowfin tuna with our bamboo poles. My crewmates showed me the ropes, were kind enough to teach me their language. Phrases like, chinga tu madre, pinche cabrón, and my favorite, hijo de la chingada, some 40 years later, on a cultural exchange to Costa Rica, I sat with my host on his patio sharing a large bottle of cerveza imperial. Armando, in his good English, commented on my Mexican accent and said, 
No one in the Spanish speaking world can swear like a Mexicano. Claro que si, was my reply. Remembering mis profesores, los pescadores. And uh, I am coming from Brownsmead at my home and uh, we, uh, the Brownsmead Flats, our last performance was one year ago. And so uh, in uh, October, we uh, did a, a video to um, several numbers and uh, we wanted to uh, play one of them for you tonight, which uh, was written by Mary Garvey, who kindly lets us uh, use her music. And this is called The Astoria Bar. Astoria's bar. Here's everybody to Astoria's bar, but a day long journey it may be. It can start at the mouth of a mighty blue river and end at the bottom of the sea. And the river still shines and shimmers in the light as it did in a rain. in the Brownsmead Grange. I've heard about that Grange, Ned. I've heard people go in there and do roller skating parties. If they get a hold of the I key. don't know, but we always have a nice big Thanksgiving potluck with 60 some folks and we dance and play music. It's a wonderful event. Well, so great to see everybody. Thanks so much. Thanks, Ned. Thanks, Mary Garvey. And I also just want to take a moment. I'm going to be tucking my thanks in here in between. And I want to start by thanking Jamie Doyle and Amanda Gladix um, around my house. You know, there's a lot of planning that gets done without some people noticing. Uh, and George was saying the other day, he was looks and he, he's like, you look at the river and you just see these ducks floating by, but there's a whole lot of action going on under the surface. And this virtual Fisher Poets is like that. Amanda makes it all really smooth, but there's a lot of action under, this, <laughs> under the water that keeps it all going. And uh, so thank you, Amanda. 
Next up, we have a new person coming to Fisher Poets from the East Coast, Charles Tecula from New York, New York. It's a pre-recorded video, so we're all curious to, to meet, uh, meet you, Charles. And I just wanted to give him a correction. He says uh, in his introduction, he meant to say that he wrote this song for Fisher Poets last year, which he had to cancel his trip out because he had to take care of his mom who has since passed. So condolences to you, Charles. And uh, can't wait to hear what you have to say. You're the fifth licensed crabber in New York state. You've been gill netting, potting blue crabs. And when we were emailing last night, Charles told me he had to go to bed early cause he was tonging uh, clams all day. So take it away, Charles. Let's see what you got. Hey everyone. I'll get right into it. I'm Chuck Tecula, fisherman on Long Island, South Shore. This is called At Work in the Garden of Eat and Be Eaten. It's been published in several publications, including the National Fisherman. On dry land, nothing's moving yet. It's still dark and cold. But in the watery fields, the feasting continues. Bluefish start like lightning in and out of the pods of bunkers that themselves still strain the tiny swimming plankton, even as their brethren are, the, are themselves devoured. Spider crabs wait for the pieces to fall and then crawl through the waving eelgrass into my waiting net for what they think is another free meal. The big bass know, but they've had their fill of these shiny fin and oily delights. Another aroma draws them in. The spiders are shedding now, it being early autumn, and the still soft ones are like warm buttered muffins right out of the oven to these bright eyes and stealthy hunters. The fish that hit early on in the night have attracted a bevy of crustaceans to my webbing they had to return the favor. We who trek the land with our shod feet don't face the constant threat of being eaten alive by our larger neighbors, at least not literally. We don't rationally worry that bugs and birds will peck us apart if we sleep a bit too soundly. And so we consume ourselves with these irrational fears, like the impending collapse of life on earth brought on by the likes of my little gillnet boat. More sensible parents wonder what to put on the dinner table. Prudent chefs wonder what they'll find at their seafood supplier to grace the specials card tonight. And if I get in early, my wonderful bluefish or weakfish or bass might be the prey that answers their prayers. But at this point in my own journey, the hardest work of the day comes first. The roughest, roughest leg of the day's excursion is the trip from the bed to the floor. Raisin bran, weather websites, and a cup of hot tea. A prayer for a safe and successful morning, and I'm off to witness another sunrise of the Garden of Eat and Be Eat. And this is a song that I actually wrote for Fisher Poets last year, but didn't go to because of the impending pandemic. Um, this is called The Loving Wild, and it's self-explanatory and kind of autobiographical. Only time will tell if a storm will bring a swell, if the fish will come with the morning sun. When I set my nets, there's nothing in them yet. I did not own a fish, I only had the wish that when I return, some money. I'd have earned in the loving wild. Fishers, one and all, we're answering the call, harvesting the field of God's provided yield. The field we did not sow, nor did we make it grow like the sunshine and the air. We awake to find it there in the loving wild. The universe is wild, it does not match your style. We're not here to change the world. Give Mother Earth her way, she will make your day. She's a kind and generous girl. Sparrow and the flower, they do not claim the power, they do not fret the soul over things. 
things they can't control. Our wants and our desires, they fuel the smoky fires. Beyond the envy and the greed, we'll find everything we need in the loving life. Postal worker's son, but I learned to work the bay. I dreamed that I would be an old man who knew the sea. I've lived to see that day. All life comes from the love of one. Like the sparrow and the flower, I do not claim the power, I do not fret the soul, or the things I can't control. So only time will tell if a storm will bring a swell. I pray the fish will come with the morning sun. I trust the loving one. That's it. Hope you liked it. I'll be watching. Awesome. Welcome. That was so great. The Loving Wild. I'm just going to put some thank yous up while I talk about the next person. I'm trying to do some AV stuff. Kevin Scribner's up next. He began salmon fishing as a skiff man on a saner out of Bellingham on the Fraser River run in 76, 78. That's 1976, 1978. Ended up in Bristol Bay where he is pursuing his dream of marketing fish and developing value added products. He's part of the slow fish movement. And he'll be at the Slow Fish Conference uh, six days at the end of March. Kevin, tell us all about it. Welcome. Well, thanks, Mo. And uh, thanks, uh, thanks for everybody who demonstrating that Fisher Poets will prevail even during a pandemic. And uh, so the two poems I read today are from my fishing days in, uh, in Bristol Bay. And the first poem is in honor of February, the Valentine month of hearts and our Fisher Poets gathering. So it's called A Sea of Love on Alaska Airways. So it goes as this. The Bristol Bay Messenger Service, FM Public Radio, where teenage interns read streams of love letters out into the Alaska bush, bereft of phones, satellite dishes, and timely mail to pillow sweet intimacies into privacy. I love and miss you. Nothing to hide when we're in love, my dear. An alchemy of affection arcs into these words made public, anti-raising the simple, I love and miss you, into a hum now among many ears over airwaves, hungry hearts nodding in their own size of reveries with memories, saddled in bunks throughout the fleet. For millennia, did mariners bundle love in pouches tenderly tucked beneath bunks, or in necklaced amulets swinging heart close? Some say being a skipper will save a marriage and make families. With housebound pressers whistled away, gone with the outgoing tide, then joy and foreplay in return with a child or three conceived in time with the moon driven ebb and flow of incoming tides. I love and miss you out around the bay and back. Again, I love and miss you. A summer season Valentine, as public as any crooner plucking heartstrings in a city. What can embarrass a fisherman in love? I love and miss you. Shared out loud, heart proud, with 10,000 souls my witness. I love and miss you. So number two, for a change of pace and character, this one's entitled, Will the Bottom Drop Out? Three decades before Siri, we wondered if fathometers would ever speak and with a siren's voice, 
No, not the honeyed voiced who lured Greek sailors into shipwrecking rocks. But she would be gently sweet. Please, gentlemen, take note. It's getting shallow. Oh my, the bottom is getting closer. Now, gents, gents, take care. You're getting much, much, much too close. But all's business when the waves become trampolines. Keep bows straight into water swelling before you. Forward movement for steerage, but don't rush into a bar where the water's dropped out. Just enough juice there to not slip to the side, a wash in the trough, and take a nanosecond of breath to bow low to the danger at your side in honor of the many fishermen before you. Up at the deck steering station, there's no hearing the captain in the stern set cabin, radio connected to the brother in a boat ahead. Me, at the wheel in rain gear, survival suit sewed way back there beneath the bunks, a lifetime away. Is this some sort of silly joke? A night drama of storm swells rising higher and then bumped even higher by everywhere shallows? Sirens, are you there? Siri, Siri, which way do we fucking go now? Sandbars everywhere, the fathometer are useless. The bottom is all about. We rely on the land in our buddy's boat, charts in our minds softly screaming, focused on a scheming way ahead. Keep bow into waves. Don't plow into a bar with no water. And do sandbars too shiftless to claim a name or a spot on a chart. And remember, always, take a breath and bow low to danger. We made it, check. Seems another one of our nine lives used, gone. We'll laugh tonight when tied up, we'll laugh when tied up tonight. And then back home, we'll reset the tally on just how many more lives we each have left to lose. So I'm gonna close with a limerick from a salmon fisherman friend, Amy Grandin. So keep in mind that oysters are a legendary aphrodisiac and that osage acidification is taking a toll on the survival of oyster larvae. So here it goes. I love these oysters, said Guido because they really help my libido. But then ocean, ocean acid made his penis flaccid and now nothing fills up his speedo. So thank you all, long live all salmon runs with those fishing. So thank you Mo and everybody, be good, take well, I love y'all. Thanks Kevin. It's always good to follow a flaccid penis, I have to say. <laughs> uh, Nice work. Enjoy that sunshine. Next up, we have um, another East Coast favorite, John Campbell, who we now get to uh, brag about as our Rhode Island Music Hall of Fame Fisher Poet, who's also the unofficial self-appointed East Coast Fisher Poet Whisperer. Once he came out to Fisher Poets, he started dragging us out to the East Coast to show them how it was done. And for that, we'll be a forever grateful. John Campbell, I think you're having bandwidth issues. So take, your, take a good look at him now. We'll probably turn his uh, video off so that to make sure his uh, audio comes through. So take it away, Campbell, live from hey. Rhode Island. <laughs> you getting me all right? Got you fine, John. All right. So I'm going to tell you a little story what happened yesterday. I was up, uh, for those of you that don't know, I live kind of near Point Judith or Galilee. It's a small place with two names, but it's kind of the, the main fishing port in this area. So I was down near there and I was renewing the registration on my vehicle. And, uh, I'm in there at the counter and we're passing forms and money back and forth and all kinds of stuff. And this guy comes storming in and he's got on his rubber boots and he's got his back deck voice. And uh, he's trying to get a copy of his driver's license. And they're telling him, well, you need your birth certificate to get that. And he says, now what do I do? He says, I got to get a copy of my social security card but I need three forms of ID to get that. So as it turns out, he just come in from a two week trip. And uh, 
while he was kind of sitting on the rail of the boat in his street clothes, getting ready to go ashore, his wallet came out of his back pocket and plopped right down in the drink. So he's in there. He says, I can't cash my check because I don't have a driver's license now. And he says, I hate to have the check deposited in my girlfriend's account because he says that I won't have any money. Talk to this guy, Dave, down at Point Judith. You know, he'll throw on a wetsuit and a couple of scuba tanks. He can probably dive down right next to where you're tied up and uh, find the wallet. You know, it's not deep there. There's not much current. Wallet's probably laying right on the bottom. This guy's right, 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 right. You know, and he walks off waving his arms across the parking lot. And it kind of reminded me, you know, there's people that solve problems when they come up. And there's people that uh, are just content to complain about problems when they come up. So I've got to say uh, about John Broderick and Amanda and everybody else that when the wallet went in the water last March, I'm glad they came up with a plan. So thanks to all of them. So I'm going to sing one. My daughter came out and surprised me in Astoria last year. And uh, she had a lot of fun. She arrived Saturday and we poked around town. And I said, let's go to Rob Seitz's and get some lunch. So we go in there and who's the first two people she meets but Cowboy Ron and Gino. So that was kind of a, a good baptism, good introduction to Fisher Poets, but. I was going to sing a different song, but she prevailed on me to sing this one. So here we go. Just last week we waited in the waters of the Nile the line into the brine of the South Pacific Isle and the waters underneath our bows to Jonah and the whale and there's the right hand side Moses C left here in this pail and the waters here within my hand once washed a mermaid's hair Francis Drake's Armada sank on the ripple over there. And these three small drops upon the oar, the float Ulysses home, round and round and round the world, the restless waters roam. This where the stone walls run, to the face of the cliff. Many times my love and I have wandered here like this, where the waters flow past the mouth of the bay, to brush the shores of distant lands, a half a world away. You know that this small drop of water turned the first rocks into sand. And this one here ran off the back of the first fish upon land. And this one soaked Atlantis as it sank beneath the waves. And this one kept the vigil at a thousand sailors' graves. So at times we might be rowing out the China Sea, the dropping pebbles in the blue from the beach in Normandy, or be soaked through by a breaking wave that came from Botany Bay. It's round and round and round the world, the waters flow each day. 
to where the stone walls run to the face of the cliff so many times my love and I would wandered here like this where the water could flow past the mouth of the bay brush the shores of distant lands a half a world away Now it's many's a man who's left his home to sail upon the seas, to seek his fortune on the waters, so many miles from these. But the further that you sail away, the quicker you float home. It's round and round and round the world, the restless waters roam. To where the stone walls run to the face of the cliff. So many times my love and I would wander here like this. Where the waters flow past the mouth of the bay, brush the shores of distant lands a half a world away. So thanks to everybody and hope to see you next year. Thanks, John. Thanks, Campbell. Thanks to the waters that roam all over the earth. I just want you to know that George and I were dancing in the living room during your song. And I know you know how hard it is to get a Protestant to dance. So it was very uh, moving. We've got Lou Beaudry next. He's going to give us a pre-recorded song. Lou is a retired commercial fisherman, but we all know that that's a, a, a phrase that doesn't mean anything. But he fished for 42 summers in Alaska, gill netting on the Copper River, Bristol Bay, and ended up his, uh, his uh, whatever you call it, career, life, obsession, Singing in uh, the Prince William Sound waters around Cordova. And uh, he's got, I love this song. As a lifelong deckhand, you'll soon understand why. So take it away, Lou, coming at you from Idaho. Hello? Am I on? Yep, tell us about your song, Lou. Okay. Um... Great to be here and see, see you all. Uh, about this song, behind every successful commercial fisherman, there's a, a competent and supportive crew. I first met a gentleman named Victor Allday. He was running the deck on a limit saner. It was in my radio group out of Cordova. Uh, Victor was born down in Chile, started fishing at a very early age and fished all up and down the west coasts of South and North America. He's just a, a really colorful character, has a lot of experience, uh, competent, fun to be around. He's got tons of stories and he'll be happy to tell them to you. Um, one, so one year he, he told us it was gonna be his last year, he was finally gonna retire. So at the end of the season, we had a party for him on my boat on H float in Cordova Harbor. And I wrote this song and sang it for him as a retirement present. So this is for, this is for Victor and for all crewmen. All right. He makes the coffee. He's up at 4 a.m. Deck is ready. Way before I.
emotions and brags a little too. It's best damn deckhand that I ever knew. Yeah, work the galley, work the deck, paint the hooks and stack the net. Take a wheel, watch, cook the dinner, always looks for jumps and dinner. Teach a green or an out man that if he's got money, he will spend it. Pull the anchor, do the dishes always as the skipper wishes. His heart is proud. anthem what's not to love about that thank you lou thank you so much and it's a good reminder to uh to all of us how fishing crews are made up of people from all over the world and for that we need to be able to travel to different places and you know in that song you said he came from a foreign land but he also came to a foreign land so as someone married to an immigrant uh it's a big it's a big uh, heart that you need to make that kind of a journey. Next up we have, so thank you, Lou. Sierra, here she is. Hi, Sierra, she's coming to us from Black Canyon, Washington. Eight summers uh, in Southeast, did a little moonlighting in Bristol Bay and she has a book of poems out called The Slow Art, published by Bear Star Press, but you can find it at the Elliott Bay Company booksellers online. And Sierra is actually bringing us a workshop this year called Seaworthy Translating Strong Emotions into Compelling Poems. So, um, you know, there's, we all have something to learn from that, especially after this season of uh, pandemic. And there's a couple other workshops. Uh, Brad Warren and guests are doing a workshop, Protecting the Waters. And John Palms is going to do a songwriting workshop. So just to give a plug out to that, Sierra. Yeah, thanks, Mo. Come join me tomorrow at 4 p.m. for some poem writing. Um, I'm not going to say a whole lot because we're all short on time. But um, I'm going to read two poems. And I picked these two um, because I moved to Eastern Washington and their poems about people who live in landlocked places, but are still fishermen. Um, and I also picked them because they're about loving things that are far away, which seems also like something that a lot of people are going through right now. Um, so the first one is called Network. Shuttles flick through diamond shaped windows, fingers flash, bend twine in stair steps, up and down cut edges, their pockets full of hooks and flagging tape Men mend the net. 
Jim recalls branding cattle as a kid in North Dakota, winter cold, just lifted, calves struggling in mud before the prairie bloomed, withered in summer heat. Playing cowboy now, he says he shot coyotes and thieves off his dad's land. You only know he's fibbing when his fingers stutter, the tiny knot coming up slack. Just one unraveled compromises the delicate lift and pull of meshes under stress. He's seen whole seams split from end to end, nose love knots pull tighter under pressure, stronger than the lines used to tie them, and starts talking about his grandmother with Alzheimer's. Each winter, she thinks every day for a week is Christmas. Last year, she fell in two feet of snow, feeding the horses hay in her hands, the wind at 10 below. She lay crying until Jim's grandfather found her. She didn't recognize him, but knew love when it grabbed her, pushing back the terror. Jim joins two lines with overhand knots, sliding them one on top of the other, pulling for tension. Sometimes the line snaps in his swollen fingers. His hands ache. He cracks his knuckles, asks the boys if they're ready for a beer, remembering his first. At 15, he drank Rainier, the bittersweet scent biting his nose while he sipped, making him crave pancakes. He didn't know why until he remembered hunting trips when he was young and hot Betty, the old flat top stove at his uncle's cabin where Jim's dad would tinker the diesel flame into smothering heat, sizzle of bacon while Uncle Joe poured hams in the pancake batter, saying our little secret, holding a burnt handled spatula, he'd flip white beer cakes midair. Outside the web locker, Jim's crew chuckles, calls it a day, each man popping a beer tab. At home, their fingers twitch all night, tie imaginary hitches, sheet bends, loop knots, a bowlin on a bite. Jim dreams of the whole net flexing, all the pearl-sized knots shrunk and snug, rippling in the current. And I'll read just one more, it's called Elegy, um, and it also has that sort of North Dakota, Alaska connection. Elegy. For breakfast, I eat the sticky rolls you made and think of riding in the fields. You always clipped the gates shut behind us, keeping the cows in their place. We never knew when they were going to take off down the highway, trotting, irretrievable, dropping slick pies on the pavement, hazards for the drivers just shifting up as they crested the bluff. Here's to the cows then, milling loosely along the fence, to the heifer with a white face and one blue eye. She drops her weight from hoof to hoof, tail and patient, flicking the flies. Here's to the rotting, to the silt on your best boots, to the glassy look your eyes took the last years. You died in August, summer harvest just beginning when you were here, needing sweet cinnamon dough, while burrs caught in the dog's fur. I was not here, 2,000 miles away, spilling fish from a seine net. I didn't even think of you, except to wonder if you'd make it through the summer. I had my own problems. The crewman sipping gin hidden in the baking bin, the skiff billowing black smoke so thick it looked as if God were smudging it off the water with a stick of charcoal. I'm here now, in time for the memorial, sitting where you sat, drinking the coffee you bought, the sticky rolls not even stale. The neighbors planted a hundred acres of sunflowers, but you knew that, having watched the tractors sow seed and having seen the sprouts shine Argentine with dew. There is no dew now, the heat too dry, the shoots rigid stalks, the blossoms about to be cut. How could I have missed it? All this scrutiny, and I miss the obvious, ordinary, stupendous eternity of love. It's as if you were still here, as if you awake in the chair, patched with a plaid blanket where the dog chewed a hole in the upholstery, as if you will look out the window and say again how beautiful the sunflowers are. Here's to you. Look, you would say, look how they tilt into the light. Thanks, everyone.
Thank you. Thanks, Sierra. And that was a very compelling uh, reason to go to your workshop. If any of us could write anything so beautiful. It's always risky when you MC at Fisher Poets because people so write so beautifully about loss and we're good at grief. Uh, thank you and condolences on your loss. Next up, Marty McCallum. I'm so glad that you made it. I was so excited to meet Marty and work out how Zoom works together. That's one of my favorite parts of my week so far. Uh, Marty C McCallum, lifelong West Coast fisherman. He has fished, like if you get in a boat and you travel from the West till it becomes East, that's Marty's fishing experience territory from the Mexican border West to East. And he, these days he's staying in a 140 year old boat called the Indiana and he loves her so much. He's given her new top house this year. So nice. Marty, take it away. Hey. Hanging out in old buildings, old wood buildings, timber frame, cannery buildings, made from trees that grew nearby, Pacific Northwest giants. All the old cannery buildings I've been in have been an adventure. Massive beams, fantastic angles, staircases heading to new levels, floor plans seemingly stretch out, to, out of sight, handrails worn smooth, Floor is shiny, polished by a hundred years of use. Machinery, of course, and other marvels to wonder about. As a pre-teenager in Seldovia, the attraction was magnetic. Mug up at 10, 3, and 9 p.m. Fresh bakery goodies, drinks, coffee for the grown-ups. Years later, I still wander old canneries. Upper levels can be the best. Alcoves with multi-paned windows light up a corner. Somebody's got a small space heater going. The smell of ancient wood, the burnished floors, bales of colorful netting tied up in ordered fashion. Welcome to the fisherman's net loft. Rows of wire cages line a wall. Storage for fishermen's equipment. I've had my own locker when I was fishing for a cannery. The question was, what cannery you fish for? Well, I'm with Nefco. That was a statement. Oh yeah, that guy's out the road at Chugach. Decent market, bunkhouse, mess hall, good tenders, plenty of storage, even haul your boat out at the end of the season. Oh yeah, nice net loft. I like hanging out in the net lofts. Gives me time to catch up on gossip, like a harbor cafe. Fishermen are trying to put their nets together. They are working. So one doesn't want to ask too many questions. If someone says howdy, well, it's only polite to respond. The seasoned fisherman uses a bench to build their gill nets. This is called hanging the net putting the webbing on the lines. These benches have adjustable arms with pins on top that one ties the knot around. The technique is to pull the needle just right to pop the knot off the pin, creating a tight knot that won't slip on the line. One sits on the bench, a pad is nice. Suffice it to say everyone customizes their personal bench. The bench is designed so that the length of the hanging can be changed. The distance determines the rate at which one picks up the meshes, called the hang of the net. If you want to learn how to hang a gill net, eh, go hang out in a net loft. Back to Alaska, I'm enjoying the smell of nets and pine tar. The old growth timbers soar above me. Panels of small pane windows brighten the area. Jack R is popping knots off his very customized hanging bench like a machine. He's got motion and rhythm. Jack is the local pro. He gave up fishing some time ago to start his own business. He builds nets as a sideline, but he sells all the components to build nets. 
Jack has been around. He knows everyone and a few more. I'm catching up on the gossip, but I have a good reason for chatting Jack up. I need to get a net hung ASAP. Jack is the fastest net hanger, period. I get to the point. Well, Jack, how many nets you got to go? Well, let me see. I'm booked up all week. That bad, eh? I was hoping you could squeeze me in. My web came in late, and I haven't been able to get to it. The fishing schedule has been brutal. Spent most of my time dealing with an outdrive. Well, I can put you on my list. I was hoping it might happen a little sooner. Jack is watching me. I slide a hundy under his coffee mug. That got his, that got his attention. His eyebrows are up now but I can see he might need a little more encouragement. Another hundy. Jack looks up with a grin. You're next. <laughs> Thanks, folks. Well, you gotta get those hundies going. You gotta peel those hundies off. Depends on the year, how many hundies you got. Thank you so much, Marty. Next up, we've got a... Uh, Brian Robertson, who, in addition to being a singer-songwriter who did some gill netting and deckhanding on a drum same boat, Mid-Coast, Rivers Inlet, and Prince Rupert, also has a background in engineering and indigenous history. And he is descended from a wild Norwegian religious sect that moved to British Columbia and built all their cabins in one winter out of pen knives, it sounds like, from what he told me. So, Brian, show us what you got. All right, can you hear me out there? Can you hear me? All right. Uh, this is a song um, that I wrote some time ago when I was, it's based on the images and um, experiences I had gill netting in the area of Rivers Inlet, the mid-BC coast. And it goes something like this. Well, the deck is clear and ready, and the glass is cold and steady. And now we're out to Gilnet in Queen Charlotte's Great. And voices on the radio say salmon have begun to show. The Becky B's just pulled in 48. Well, I'm a set. Where several years ago I caught a net so full of sock on half my corks had disappeared. See the jumper to the right, mine's the only boat in sight. And once again my drum rolls out the gear. Oh, I love to count those corks going down, down, down. Salmon running by the ton, I love every pound. Rolling out my net. Then I'll count those corks going down. Last night we were a dozen boats tied up at a shelter, boat aurora shooting all around the northern sky. We packed into a galley tight by amber glow of oil light. Songs and well love stories past the time. Old Tommy, he spun fables about his life at poker tables, and the cards would dance like puppets from his nimble hands. He says the same of gill netting, it's a game of nerves and betting, and you help the odds along as best you can. Oh, I love to count those cards going down, 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 salmon running by the ton, I love every pound. Rolling out my net, gonna make a high line set, and then I'll count those corks going down. Well, it's a life beset with danger, and surprise is not a stranger. When you try to make a living on a gill net boat, well, sometimes the fish don't show where prices are just too damn low. No one seems to care if you're a flower. 
of it went for all my trials. I said, take the wiles and help you my neck the fish and their beady little eyes. I'll dream of that big payoff. I know it can't be way off, or I'll scare myself about a job inside. Oh, I love to count those corks going down, down, down. Salmon running by the time I love every pound. Rolling out my net, gonna make a high line set, and then I'll count those corks going down. Off the stern quarter, rising straight out of the water, I see two dolphins standing high upon their tail. Oh, they look so sweet and silly, mating belly to white belly, cause from eye to eye they wear those crazy smiles as they sing that kind of sight. Everybody, it's really great to be part of this program. Thank you so much, Brian. That was so great. We love to see those corks going down unless they're snagged, and that's why they're going down. We don't like to see them going under, so let's have some moderation. Next up, we have Pat Dixon. I see you, Veronica. I saw you peek in there. <laughs> 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 uh, Pat Dixon, I have you down here as a Fisher poet, ambassador extraordinaire, and impresario, because once Pat found the gospel of Fisher poets, he started planning events and taking <laughs> Fisher poets everywhere, and we love him for it. Uh, Fish Cook Inlet for 20 years. Oops, sorry, you got to see behind the scenes there. Did you like that? Because Pat has also published a book of poems an anthology of five different beautiful little books of work by all the Fisher poets and he is included in Clem Stark's brand new Fest Shrift, which is um, a thing people publish when poets turn 80 or writers turn 80. And so everybody pretended they were Clem and wrote a thing and Pat's in that. So if you didn't get enough Pat here tonight, you're kidding, find him all around. So. Take it away, Pat, we love you. Thank you, Mo. I am from Gilnetters, from the Skookum Two and Veronica K. I am boats floating a night sea, circles on the back of a wave. I am from salmon slime, flake ice, scales, and gurry. I am hissing stick rips, glassy seas, wild horse, white mane, wave stampedes. I am waterhall and roundhall, radio fish and sunken nets, clatters, splashers, nudgers, jerkers, nothing much, and better get over here right away. I am from beer on the back deck, baseball caps, flotation vests, and rubber boots. I am Grundons, extra tufts, Vickies, and stormy seas. I am where sunrise ignites the sea. Volcanoes vent over the island. Belugas rise to greet stars. I am needles of rain on my cheeks, salt spray on the windshield, the shuddering slam of the hull. I'm a fire in the cabin, a blown fan belt, oil in the bilge, catching a line from a tender for a tow. I am a flash in the distance, white caps in the rip, bow slicing an ocean swell, foam in my wake. Well, I'd like to thank everybody 
for for putting this together this year. It's uh, way beyond uh, what what I thought it could be, and I'm thoroughly enjoying it. We've been here both nights, and it, this is just a, a wonderful event. And so, thanks to John Broderick and Amanda and everybody behind the scenes that put this put this together. It's really really worth it. And um, you know, I, after the we didn't make it last year because uh, uh, we had some health problems, and so we listened on the radio. This is far better than that. I'll say, and so it's been it's been two years for us to to see everybody in person. So I was I I spent the spring uh, after the pandemic hit hit writing a memoir called Waiting to Deliver, and this next poem is uh, the title piece from it. And one of the things I wanted to do after being in the pandemic and going through the depression of of it last spring is I wanted to find something positive um, to write about, and so this is that. On the good day, when boats return home, low in the water, holds full, nets wrapped around salmon rolled on the reel. After picking half the net and laying it back out while fish keep hitting, then running to the other end and doing it again all day long. No time for breaks, a sandwich, or even water. Your face, beard, and glasses streaked black by gurry, dotted white with scales back aching, fingers and wrists sore. You find energy reserves, threads of adrenaline buried deep sustain you till you've made the run home and toss a line to the boat you tie behind, the last of a dozen hanging off the port stern next to a matching group tied to the starboard side of the tender taking fish anchored in the middle of the river. This day of donkey work this day of absolution isn't over, won't be for hours. At the back of the queue, you know you'll be here past dinner, past dark, maybe past dawn. You'll eat a baked potato and a red salmon garnished with lemon, onion, and butter less than two hours from the time you plucked it alive from the sea. You'll wash it down with a cold beer from the cooler watch the sunset and think how this is the best, most complete life you can imagine. Salt air cools as shadows lengthen and the water changes from blue to black. You trade bunk time with your deck hand and fall asleep before your head hits the pillow. The smack of a boat hook on the bow wakes you both as the next boat in line cuts you all loose to go deliver and those of you still tethered, tethered together like a serpent in the glare of arc lights work to move up, fighting the river's flow, pulled and yanked off course by boats fore and aft, bumping throttles forward, neutral, reverse, trying not to ram the one ahead of you, hoping the one behind you does the same. Your deckhand fends off as you swing too close to the vessels sleeping to starboard, until the lead boat tosses a line around the tender's cleat again, and you all slide back in the current like a sigh. Engine after engine goes silent. Lines creak around the cleats as they stretch taut. Your crew slips into the bunk while you settle back in the skipper's chair, light a smoke, and sip a cold cup of coffee. You're still waiting, waiting to deliver. Thanks, Mo. Thanks, everybody. Glad to, glad to see you. Looking forward to the rest of it. Oh, it's a long couple of years it's been. We sure miss you. I was going to make a bingo card for everybody to just mark off like when we do the, the things on Zoom. I just talked with my mic muted. All right. We have an academic in the house actually not in my house she's in eagle river alaska she teaches history at the university of anchorage and she is newly appointed as the alaska state historian which is very fancy for fisher poets but she and i met at fisher poets a number of years ago so long ago we know there's two digits in the number but neither one of us can remember what year it was yeah it was a while ago but we don't have to talk about you know aging and stuff <laughs> well 
here she is to give us a bunch of uh, historical, fascinating information. Are you going to talk about the pandemic? Just a little bit, but if uh, folks want to, uh, uh, oops, why isn't this working? If folks want to uh, um, go to the website, then they can uh, check out a video that we produced, a quick seven minute video we produced on the pandemic in Bristol Bay. So it's on the Fisher Poets website, so you can check that out. So uh, I just want to take a second to introduce myself again. Mo did a great job. My name is Katie Johnson Ringsmith. I was one of the very first Fisher poets so long ago. I now teach history, currently the state historian. And I really want to take a second to thank John Broderick, Mo, and the rest of the Fisher Poets Organizing Committee who have graciously allowed me to share with you a bit of the visual history. Not much of a poet, but, uh, but I, we have an incredible story to tell. And for the last five years, I have led a project called the N.A. Cannery History Project. This is a grassroots history endeavor that through the historical lens of work aims to share the oft forgotten stories of the multitudes of people who canned salmon in Alaska and created an ethnically diverse, economically vital cannery culture. And the story we intend to tell is called Mug Up, the Language of Work. So the project revolves around the Diamond N.N. Cannery at South Naknek in Bristol Bay, the cannery where my father served as the last APA superintendent, and I slimed my way through school. In 2015, Trident Seafoods, the current owner, permanently closed the cannery, and on hearing the news, I put together a team that included fisheries experts, Alaska historians, curators, artists, filmmakers from Juneau to Anchorage to Naknek, who embraced my mission to share the story of Alaska's historically underrepresented cannery people with the whole world. Now to achieve our ambitious mission, we set our sights on four interrelated goals. And to date, the NN Cannery History Project has successfully nominated the Diamond NN Cannery Maritime Historic District to the National Register of Historic Places. We supported a digital storytelling workshop for Bristol Bay youth. We've collected interviews with former cannery people for an online oral history repository. And uh, we are in the process of developing an exhibit called Mug Up, the Language of Work, slated to open at the Alaska State Museum in Juneau in 2022, so one year from now. And if you are in Bristol Bay around festival time uh, this upcoming summer, while well, you want to join Tim Troll and the Sailing Back to the Bay group to celebrate 75 years since the age of sale came to its end in Bristol Bay. And to find out more, you can go to the Any Cannery Project. Uh, you definitely want to check out Tim's uh, adventure in his double ender uh, to celebrate this pivotal year. Now in 2017, our project received an NEH grant to revive, reunite, and raise awareness for the multicultural community that has existed in canneries throughout the Pacific Slope for over a century. The grant not only gave our project national attention, but honed our history activities on Alaska's essential workers and topics of social equity and racial justice. The result is a tangible community-driven deliverable that brings Alaska into the national conversation. As the Humanities uh, Alliance declared, Mug Up is a project for the moment. So the exhibition is, spot, is inspired by the unique cannery ex expression, Mug Up, which as you all know means coffee break. With work days lasting sometimes until midnight, Alaska cannery workers welcomed the 15 minute pause, which refueled them with caffeine and pastries and, and provided a uh, respite from the, mo the, mo the monotony of the slime line and momentarily brought disparate people from distant places together in unique ways. So in addition to the lap of tides, the squawk of seagulls and the rumbling of fishing boats, scores of languages might be heard on the dock at Mug Up. Historically Chinese, Mexicans, Japanese, Filipinos, Puerto Ricans, African Americans, Croatians, Italians, Scandinavians, Dena Inna, Supiak, Yupik, men as well as women, the young and the seasoned, all work side by side at one time or the other. And their collective knowledge of the mechanical operation, the physical labor, and the salmon formed the cannery's industrial backbone. 
Yet, despite their skill and labor, these cannery workers existed in the shadows only to be marginalized, exotified, or ignored in the popular narratives of Alaska's salmon fishery. So the mug-up exhibition aims to drill deep into the occupational and personal history of cannery workers and show how canning salmon reflects our nation's history. And contained in the N.A. Cannery's century-old buildings are stories that underpin the historical manifestations of capitalism, incorporation, industrialization, immigration, world wars, global pandemics, statehood, resource management, unionization, segregation, gender equality, and civil rights. From the establishment as a four-building saltery to the expansion into a globally reaching 51-building industrial complex, the NN Cannery is representative of the Industrial Revolution of the North. So in our efforts to tell this story, we have amassed this extraordinary collection of photos that document the forgotten experience of cannery work. So this, these historic images, they come from a variety of collections. Some are published while others have never been viewed before by the public. Together, they tell a visual story of cannery life from the voyage embarked from San Francisco and sailing to Alaska. The photos provide rare insights into the lives of these cannery people from the Scandinavians and the Italian fishermen, the Asian crews and even the surprise of children. They convey the firsthand experience of arrival and the transition from ship to shore, the optimistic fishermen and the promise of a new salmon season. They reveal the little known experience of the Mexicans, the Puerto Ricans and the African-American crews who use music and song to cope with the hardships of the voyage. And the photos provide a perspective of those already here. These were the Supiak people whose villages occupied the blunt bluffs of Bristol Bay, exposed mud flats, offered generous meals to the mindful beachcombers, and deep channels brought skilled seafarers safely home while the ebb and flow of tides told time. The photos also tell a story that goes far beyond putting fish into a can. While the global pandemic wiped out entire villages, canners converted canneries into orphanages. Left in the pandemic's wake was a young generation who courageously gave rise to Bristol Bay's future. And these photos offer glimpses into Bristol Bay salmon fishery, the iron men of Bristol Bay and the age of sail. This is also a story of change and modernization, a story of nature's bounty and the greatest salmon fishery on the planet. The photos reveal activities of the beach gang and the working waterfront and the dock crew. They tell the story of the first cannery superintendents and the very last. And they show how the cannery store introduced American capitalism into rural Alaska and how the industry imported from the lower 48 every tin, all the wood and even the food for the mess hall crew to feed the cannery workforce. The photos tell a story of the operators at the radio shack and the laundry ladies and the wintermen and the local residents who constituted the Springfall crew. The photos reveal the so-called monkey wrench gang, the immigrant carpenters who built the canneries and the skilled machinists who mechanized them. And the photos document the experience of the Chinese workforce who in the early years conducted all of the canning by hand, they did it all. And the fish house crews, China gang, who after the passage of the Chinese Exclusion Act consisted primarily of Mexicans and African Americans. The photos speak to the story of the Filipino workers whose labor and union activities ended the corrupt contract system, as well as the introduction of women into the cannery workscape that corresponded with the introduction of the egg house in the decades after World War II. These photos show how over time, these ethnically diverse crews produced a pack of canned salmon at the end of the season, ready to ship to markets all over the world. These historic images are windows into the working lives and the deaths of Alaska's cannery people. They share the untold story of the social activities, 
the diverse workforce who each experienced cannery life in their own unique ways, revealing insights into how they coped, how they interacted, how they were segregated, how they danced, how they played, and how they became empowered through cannery work. The photos spanning a time period of 100 years humanize what is all too often considered menial labor conducted by invisible people, people whose oft forgotten stories are still contained in these cannery spaces. So the aim of the mug up exhibit is to move cannery workers from the shadows of history and assign their work meaning. For Bristol Bay youth to be equally proud of a mother who canned fish as a father who caught them. Whether originating from China, the Philippines, or simply upriver, cannery people found dignity through their laborious interactions and left a mark on Alaska history and culture. Individuals working in cooperative effort underscore the Aristotelian principle that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts and that cannery history means more than just canning fish. So for those visitors who have never stepped foot in a cannery, these images will tell the story of hard work, which is a universal concept that connects that little known cannery experience to knowledge and value shared by visitors from California, China, or even Kansas. And these are just a small sample of the images that my team has collected over the last five years for this mug up exhibition, which hopefully will do as John Steinbeck once wrote, to open the page and let the stories crawl in by themselves. So for more information about the exhibit, or if you want to honor uh, uh, someone you know, a fisherman with a cork where you, and have Marsha Dale hang them for the exhibit, or if you even have an object that you really think should be represented in this I I exhibit, give me a shout and I'd love to hear from you. Again, if you wanna hear more about this crazy project we're doing, uh, you can just uh, Google NA Cannery Project and you'll see a whole bunch of information and uh, here are some of the uh, places where we got the photos. So I'm gonna stop sharing now and thank you all for inviting me and sharing your beautiful poetry with me. It's very inspiring and I might be contacting you guys to be a part of my exhibit. So thank you all. Thank you so much, Katie. I forgot to tell the YouTube audience that Katie was taking up two slots, 10 minutes, because she's also representing Tim Troll, the historian. And we're just gonna roll right into Rich King, uh, who's giving us some of our beloved uh, poetry from our beloved elder passed on ancestor Smitty, Harrison Smitty Smith. So Rich is coming at us from Hawaii, Cook Inlet Fisherman, been staying in Prince William Sound lately. We love you, Rich. Say hi to Marsha. Okay, are we up? You're on, Rich. We can hear you great. Okay. Thank you, Mo. Um, on a personal note, Marsha and I are fine. We're hunkered down. The kids are here. They're hunkered down with us. This place is busy and sometimes challenging. Um, wow. Speaking of history, I am going to do my favorite Smitty Smith poem tonight. Uh, I have tons of poetry, but Smitty was mentor and peer and dear friend to many of us. And I hope that this little bit helps you guys remember him. Rubber Hooks Divine. According to a fisherman whose name was Divine, the world's a cafeteria, you get one trip through line. With this fact and firmly planted in his mind, he set his sights on having the best that he could find. He was always dreaming of a life of luxury, but the way that things were going was likely not to be because in order to accomplish these somewhat lofty goals, he sorely needed every fish that bent his trolling poles. So long and loud he would complain when a fish slipped off his line. Consequently, he was known as rubber hooks divine. By unjust fate or foul luck, lost fish his dreams were thwarted, resulting in domestic when he'd rather have imported. Resigned to screw top bottles, no cork stoppered stuff, be damn those fish that got away, making his life rough. And he had a box of crackers and no beluga caviar, and he drove a beat up Chevy and no fancy German car. 
quality of life and intricate design, those are serious matters for rubber hooks divine. Well, he had a lot of friends among the other trollers, but of course included were no mega bucks high rollers. So when a cruise ship bound for Sitka happened by to pass, he took the opportunity to view the upper class. Rubber hooks maneuvered as close as he dared to sail and a real nice looking lady was waving from the rail. A diamond necklace round her throat had slipped its fragile clasp and tragically it fell away despite her frantic grasp. Now diamonds sparkled in the sun as they plunged into the brine and by chance became entangled on his port side bow line. Now rubber hooks was trolling a diamond studded lure that no salmon could resist and that was for sure. Because there came an instant stretching of the spring and the diamond lure was inhaled by a 35 pound king. Well, rubber hooks crossed his fingers and put the girdy into gear that this salmon might depart was his greatest fear. Oh yes, he got the salmon with the diamonds on the hook and he clutched onto the necklace and off for Sitka town he took. Well, on the way he was overcome by the strangest feeling if he kept and sold this necklace, in fact, he would be stealing. So he approached the cruise ship office and he left this note. I found a diamond necklace and I've got it on my boat. I want to return it because it isn't mine and I'm tied up to the fishing float. Signed, Rubber Hooks Divine. So while he was fixing supper from the door, there came a knocking. And when Rubber Hooks looked up, what he saw was shocking. Same good looking lady from the cruise ship deck. And she sure looked good to Rubber Hooks, despite no diamond around her neck. Come in, I've got your necklace and a seat, please take. I'm just fixing supper here, have some salmon steak. So they begin to get acquainted and as they begin to dine on salmon steaks and fried potatoes washed down the screw top bottle of wine, the lady was impressed and she began to feel that she'd never met a better man or had a better meal. She says, I'm really jealous of the life you lead. So what I'm really hoping is a partner you and a deal was promptly struck that fulfilled both their wishes. Rubber hooks whistled, tying gear, and she sang while washing dishes. And yes, they still fished together. And although his nickname stuck, nevermore was rubber hooks heard to curse his luck. Smitty Smith, our dear friend, mentor, and peer. Okay, um, I cannot wait to get back to Alaska and go fishing. It's all I think about every day. Okay, you characters, get out of here. Uh, bye. Rich, I thought you retired again. <laughs> Are you on your third, third flunked retirement? Thank you so much, Rich. Uh, one of my favorite things about that poem is that my grandmother was named Divine, Mary Divine. Uh, so another Irish woman is up next, Billy Delaney. Uh, fish is out of Graveyard Point and also uh, right near her house in Brownsmead on an experimental fish trap. I'm gonna let her tell you about herself because we're coming right up on the ending here. Hi, Billy. Give us what you got. Hi, Mom. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I'm gonna try to be quick because we're we're so limited on time. But it, what an incredible opportunity to be here and thank you to all the MCs and all the tech people and everyone who made it possible for us to be here. Um, I've never wished I was in a sweaty bar more in my life. Um, needless to say, it's been a wild ass year. Um, as spring approaches now and with it the thoughts and plans of the upcoming summer salmon season, I wanted to take this opportunity to talk about some of the big things that I've gone through and that we've all gone through in the last year since we were all together. I'd like to start by acknowledging the incredible stress that everyone has been under and the incredible choices that a lot of us have had to make. Thinking back to last spring, one of the most challenging aspects of the place we were in in the pandemic was the difficulty of generating such critical planning around the fishery with so many daunting unknowns in every facet of our life. On a national level, we were at a point where we were in a debate that was weighing basically the economy and what was an acceptable loss of life. 
This was an even more nuanced conversation when you point out the fact that the presence of disease kills people, but the absence of livelihood also kills people. It was a moment of highlighting the economic disparities, healthcare disparities, and pressure that Black folks, Indigenous folks, and people of color, immigrants have been living with. There's also been the largest racial justice uprising in this country in my lifetime so far. <sighs> it's been a lot. Um, scarcity and fear historically have had the unfortunate effect of dividing workers. For me, this past year has served to highlight the multitude of ways that I've been so privileged in my life and career and has deepened my sense of connection to the values and principles that I held before. It's made me think a lot about the ways that I can live those principles more meaningfully in my workplace. For myself and for another, a number of other non-Indigenous folks, some of whom you're gonna get to hear from tonight, this year that looked like listening to the requests made by Yupik, Denaina, and Sukyak leaders and healthcare professionals that the fishery not take place on the same, same scale this season. For me, that looked like choosing not to participate in the Bristol Bay fishery this year. I'm coming up on a decade of fishing out at Graveyard Point on the Quijack River of Bristol Bay, which is really paltry compared to the lifetimes or centuries of connection that a lot of people have to that place. The history specific to the name of our fish camp, Graveyard Point, almost corny in its relevance to the present circumstance is so-called for the bodies of people who died during the 1919 Spanish flu pandemic and were buried in what is now a rapidly eroding cut bank. A hundred years later, and the bodies have almost all fallen out of the cliff. While in past seasons, I have not found it to be 100% reliable that my cannery is able to provide us with donuts at mug up. Suddenly processing crews and local Bristol Bay residents were being asked to rely upon our canneries for potentially life-saving medical care last year. What was asked, being asked of watershed residents was that they put their faith in an industry to ensure the safety and well-being of their communities. This request I'd point out was strikingly similar to what has been being asked by mining interests of Bristol Bay residents. As all of this was unfolding and the massive undertaking of making a season happening was barreling towards us last spring, there were very few mentions being made of the protections that would be available for the very large sector of essential workers who declared, who make the whole thing possible, namely the cannery workers. And while the season was declared a success by most, it made me think about how absent fishermen's voices have historically been in the labor struggles of cannery workers. In years past, I've noted an absence of the voices and stories of fish processing workers from the Fisher Poets Gathering. The outbreak at the Akatan plant has been weighing super heavy on my mind lately. And I wanted to say how much I appreciated hearing a poem from Nancy Cook last night and hearing that incredible con contribution from Katie Ringsmith just now. Um, I was pretty dismayed to hear that of the 700 workers in Akatan, uh, um, <laughs> uh, about half of the 700 workers in Akatan who have been working there this winter uh, became sick with COVID. 19 in the past month. And I was really dismayed to hear that there was only one nurse on hand helping them out. <sighs> um, all that's kind of to say, as we're coming out on the other side of this, um, I'm just really, really happy that hopefully we can let go some of all of this heaviness of what the last year has been and also take some of the new skills that we've been developing of uh, mutual aid and community care into our profession uh, in the coming year and, and think about ways that we can help out our, our neighbors and 
these other really important members of our community that aren't always represented at Fisher Poets. Um, with that, I wanna thank you all for being here. If you're interested, there's a great organization called Pescando Justicia that's been doing some really inspiring work and organizing with cannery workers on the East Coast. And I wanna thank you for being here. And I wanna thank you for all the great work you're gonna do in advance. With that, I would love to hand it back to Mo Baustern. And um, she is going to be the next and last performer of this set. If anybody doesn't know Mo Baustern, I don't know where you've been. Uh, Mo has fished from Miami to Alaska. She's published an incredible amount of zines and she has a new offering this year called Good Night People of Earth that I can't recommend enough. You can contact Mo Baustern on her Instagram, Mo, M-O-E, Baustern, B-O-W-S-T-E-R-N. And um, her newest offering is just a lot of the writing <laughs> that she's been putting out in her daily digest, which is just an incredible asset to living. And please go to her site, check it out, purchase her zines, read her writing. Thank you and welcome Mo Baustern. Thanks, Billy. Uh, <clears throat> I'm gonna be a little bit short. I love you guys. I love you, Billy. Um, fishermen are really good at grief. We're good at grief because we have to live with it so much and it's potential. And I have found during this pandemic that my skills that I were so hard won for me as a scrambling greenhorn from the East Coast have served me so well during this pandemic when I could pivot over and over again and be uncomfortable and be deprived and still look and be like, I'm in my house with my cats and we have enough food and we're doing fine and I'm making art and I'm getting helped out and I'm helping other people out. And I do thank my fishing community for those skills. I'm holding the red and the green one day we'll all go between my friends. I lost two very special people this year and I'm so sorry, I'm gonna give you some tears tonight, but one of the things that's part of the things you don't see moving under the water is the people that hold a warm welcome for us when we come to Astoria. And my friend Leroy Adolphson left the planet very suddenly in June or July. And we stayed with him. He's a longtime hairdresser, native of third generation Finn of Astoria. His grandmother was a fighting red Finn. She fought for people's rights. And um, what a lovely man. Fashion plate, uh, art, art supporter, and just a beautiful man. Um, and I will miss him forever, as will Astoria. And I lost my friend Wendy Beck, and I'm gonna read this poem that I actually wrote for Joel when his dad passed. I'm gonna read it for my dear friend Celeste. Wendy Beck is a fisherman that you'll know from um, George's zine. It's called uh, Good Night, uh, his zine, Love George. Well, it's my zine, but George did the writing and it's about his time fishing with Wendy and Harvey up in Alaska and Wendy was, she just got in a cancer undertow and it just took her, took her right away. Diagnosed September, October, gone in December. And I don't have enough time to tell you about the giant hole that's leaving in my heart. It feels harder when death comes in the springtime. You send the grief over the rail each day, haul it back over and over, never get a decent price. A 4th of July about loss and memory, midpoint of a long season. So scan the hills between fish, see the pink blush on the land where the fireweed blooms, break the heart into fluff too fine to feel in calloused salt sore hands. Chaminarian angustifolium grows wild across the Northern hemisphere. All people use it for food, tea, 
beauty, and of course, liquor. First to sprout after a forest blaze, wartime Londoners called it bombweed, its cheery stalk. First to return and dance in the ruins that had been homes, schools, structures of safety. Fireweed essence eases PTSD, transmutes anger and shock into experiences manageable for a human container. In Blackfeet country, in Russia, on Clinket land, people wove the fluff into blankets that held the healing fire of summer close through the long dark half of the year. May your grief burn clean through you, cauterize you in the crucible of loss. May you bloom, reborn each day with all your scars and cracks emerging from the rubble to grasp the bright wild fish of your life. Oh boy, we're gonna miss those people. Here's the zine. I'm gonna sing you a song and then we're gonna be done. And I love y'all. This is a work song. It's about fishing because it's a song you sing when you're doing the real hard work of social change. <clears throat> and Megan Emerson, the tugboat, uh, Deck can't help me with this. You can sing along if you know it. They laid George Floyd out on the ground. Though they beat us down, we will not shatter. His spirit rises all around. And we stand for Black Lives Matter. Holloway on everything. Though they beat us down, we will not shatter. Holloway, let me hear you sing. We stand for Black Lives Matter. The silent dead, we say each name, though they beat us down, we will not shatter. Let not your lives be lost in vain, and we stand for Black Lives Matter. All the way on everything, though they beat us down, we will not shatter. All the way, let me hear you sing, and we stand for Black Lives Matter. When life's a coin, we fight for worth, though you beat us down, we will not shatter. All we've got is each other and the earth, and we stand for Black Lives Matter. All the way on everything, though they beat us down, we will not shatter. All the way, let me hear you sing, and we stand for Black Lives Matter. Okay, that's the end of my set. That's the end of our night. We have 21 minutes before we go back into our eight o'clock set. Thank you all so much. Everybody did great. We love you. Good night. Hello. Hello, hello. And welcome to back to the virtual Fisher Poets Gathering. Oops, I don't have my good light on, but I have one, folks. Here we are. I'm so glad you're here with me tonight. It is now the eight o'clock hour. The lineup is up on fisherpoets.org. And uh, I will also be introducing each of our next performers. First, I would like to go ahead and take a few moments to acknowledge the land we're standing on or perhaps the land you're floating near if you're any anybody's on a boat tonight um i want to honor not only the land but the communities who stewarded these places since time immemorial i myself am on uh lummy and nooksack territory in bellingham washington also uh fish in yupik and Supiak territory so i would love for you to join me in honoring the land that you're on Thank you. Okay, and I also invite you folks to use the chat. Uh, those on YouTube, it should be right there on the right side. Um, we, the performers can't hear you, but uh, we love knowing that your energy is there with us. So throw some exclamation points in there, some plus signs, um, some hoot and hollering. We'll be doing that here in the Zoom chat as well. And finally, before we start, my first thank you is to all the venues who typically host us in Astoria. Um, many of them are small, and I know that it's been a challenge for food service, bars, and restaurants um, around the country this year. And we so, so can't wait to be in Astoria um, 
packed into the voodoo room or um, filling up the whole Columbia theater. So thank you for hosting us for so long. And thanks to our attendees for being, uh, being patient as we do this virtually. So with that, I want to welcome our first performer for the eight o'clock block. That person is George Wilson. George, come on up. Um, George was born in Scotland and now lives in Portland, Oregon. He's fished the North Sea and Northeast, Northeast Atlantic, did that for over 20 years, but he's also did two years set netting in Kodiak, which you can read about in this zine. Love George, letters from fish camp. And uh, Joe also has paintings up in Astoria's imaging gallery, which you can also be viewed online. So take a moment to do those, but I'm gonna leave it to George. Thank you. Thank you, Elma, for that beautiful introduction. Okay, I'm going to do a, it's a short piece called Rocco. We've been inside first with the pandemic, then we had a curfew because of police riots. Then we had the fires. I've been thinking a lot about my country, about Scotland, and the end of the world and how we got here. I've been thinking about a place called Rockall. I've only fished Rockall once. The Rockall Bank is in the Atlantic. It's 240 miles southwest of the butt of Lewis, the most northerly part of the Isle of Lewis, which is 40 miles off the west coast of Scotland. So it's 240 miles southwest of that. It's just over a day's steam in our boat, the D side, doing nine knots. There's a hundred fathom edge, which is 40 miles west of the Hebrides. Boats fish the hundred fathom edge or deeper, but then it just goes deeper and deeper. And then it rises again to become the rock all bank. It's way out there. It's a huge bank of relatively shallow water, which rises up from, from very deep water. Rock all is at the northern edge of it. The fishermen just refer to it as the rock. It stands 57 feet above the ocean, except in the winter time when the swells kind of swamp it. But it's a huge lump of granite. I fished out there, but I've only seen it in the distance as we were fishing the deeper waters around the edges of the bank for monkfish and megram. You can see photographs of it online. It's the last land grab made by the British Empire when in 1955 they lowered two marines and an ornithologist and raised the British flag and claimed the valuable fishing and mineral rights for the United Kingdom. Scotland is the closest landfall. A 2013 Guardian article by Jason Rodriguez reports that the islet first appeared on maps 400 or so years ago. The name come from, comes from the Scots Gaelic word Rockabara which is the name of a mythical island that comes and goes three times. Its third appearance, the story goes, heralds the end of the world. In 1904, 600 Northern European emigrants bound for New York on the passenger liner Norge perished when their ship struck a reef a few miles from the rock. There were about 100 survivors. Rockall is said to have been mistaken for an iceberg, a sailing ship, a whale, and a submarine. An armed merchant cruiser, thinking it was an enemy, enemy vessel, warned it to surrender in the First World War before opening fire. Peter Smith, the man responsible for the introduction, which led eventually to me marrying Mo, moving to the United States, fishing in Alaska, and becoming a fisher poet, Peter Smith used to fish Rockall a lot, and on one summer trip, he sailed close and two of his crew swam and scrambled onto the rock. They fished hurricks there and cord, used to catch huge cord, just enormous cord, and squid in the summertime. That shallow bit where the rock is, there's a place there where they got a ton of squid. Usually the bigger boats went out there and they just filled up with haddock really quickly. In the heyday of it, in the 80s and 90s, they just went back and forth, 
filling up. We had a paper boy in the village named Neil Wood, a fine loon, as, as you say, a good boy. I remember sitting watching the TV and him coming and delivering the papers. He graduated Bucky High in 1992 and went straight to the fishing, worked for Davy Main on the Aurora. They were fishing Rockall and the weather, it was fourth net, force nine, sustained winds of 48 to 55 knots with gusts considerably more. Boats were fishing and they were hauling broadside to the weather and the boat got hit by a wave and Neil was washed over the side. He lost his life and his body was never found. He lost his life at Rockall. This is what I've been thinking about as we've been shut inside from the pandemic and the wildfire smoke and the civil unrest. About a rock in the Atlantic that comes and goes, that makes money for some, but from others demands the highest price. Is the end of the world coming in clouds of wildfire smoke? or in the tear gas, or in a force nine gale. Thank you. Back to you, Elma. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you, George, for kicking us off this eight o'clock hour. Love having you here every year. And I loved reading letters from Fish Camp um, out loud with my crew a couple years ago. Up next from Long Beach, Washington is Jan Bono, who has been a Fisher girl, Fisher wife, and Fisher wife, excuse me, and Fisher poet um, for most of her life. At two, she was even tied to her boat in case uh, she fell in the water by her father, but uh, she made it through. And in addition to poetry, Jan writes a cozy mystery series set on the Southwest Washington coast. You can learn more about Jan and uh, purchase her work at janbonobooks.com. Welcome Jan, thanks for being here. Go on ahead, Jan. Oh, all right. <laughs> I didn't see my picture come up on the screen. Thank you, Elma, and uh, good evening, everyone. Yes, I'm Jan Bono from Long Beach, Washington. And back in the 1980s, I was part of the commercial fishing industry by marriage only, but I have maintained a healthy respect for the men and women who make their living out on the ocean. Uh, my first of three poems is dedicated to Dana McMurrick Monson. She's a former student of mine, and she's the daughter of the subject of this first poem, which takes us back to December, 1982, when we lost the Midnight Express off Tillamook Head. It's called Capsized. Their fishing boat had capsized in towering 20-foot seas. The five-foot life raft tossed about in a vicious freezing breeze. Two men had made it to the raft, but they couldn't reach two more crew. Another was stranded below the deck and there was nothing they could do. There'd been no time to don the suits, which would have helped them stay afloat. The trawler rolled fast and then it sank. No distress signal came from the boat. The waves increased to 40 feet, no point in trying to use the oars. They were headed north on the current along the Washington shore. After 40 hours at the ocean's whim, the raft drifted close to the beach. They could see the lights of the cabins that maybe they could reach. They heard the waves break on the beach, a quarter mile at best. They could sense their time was now and this was really gonna put them to the test. Tumbled over and over in the surf, three quarters drowned and mouthful of sand. One made the shore and crawled out upon the land. Two men had struggled in the dark, but only one emerged alone. Somehow broke into a summer place where he used the telephone. You've made it this far, the dispatcher said, and I know that you are weak, but flash those inside house lights for the ambulance to seek. His rescuers drove up the beach where his family would often played the thought of his wife and children had kept him from being afraid. When they'd left the port together, the crew had numbered five, but their fickle ocean mistress let only one come home alive. And the second poem takes us up to Alaska in May, 1988, 
and it's dedicated to Michelle Main Brown, who is also the daughter of the subject of this poem. And it's called, God Bless the Captain. They say the day was rather calm when the Golden Venture went down. Three of the four who'd been on board were in the life raft that was found. The fishing vessel that picked them up was the Hazel Lorraine back then. The distress call came from the captain who was thinking only of his men. The trawler was simply making a turn like hundreds of times before. Her net was down and she came around, but disaster was in store. She went down near Unaska Island in the Aleutian Island chain. Three men were saved and one was lost and the lost was Rodney Maine. We know he died a noble death, but what about his wife? How hard it must have been for her to carry on with life. But men who fish for a living can't stay on land for long. The sea will always call them with a beautiful siren song. So God, please bless those fishing vessels wherever they might roam. And God, please do the best you can to bring them safely home. And now a quick nod to my fellow poets. More than 90 of them are here on Zoom this weekend. And, and I think being here sharing their work is just pretty freaking awesome. Um, this short four line poem is called Fisher Poets. And it's dedicated to my two poetic mentors, Gino Leach and Dave Densmore. You know, if, if I were to pick two better poetic mentors, well, I don't think I could. So this is for them. Those who love the sound of nature like the lapping of waves against the bows of their boat. They often love putting strings of words together just to see if they will float. So thanks for including me this year. And like Elma said, for more of my fishing poetry or some of my other work, please check out my website, janbonobooks.com. And I hope to see you all in person in Astoria in 2022. Thanks. Thank you, Jan. Jan, really, some of those poems brought up the a hard part of commercial fishing, which are the dangers that Mo also mentioned. And the Oregon coast has had a rough winter, the crab fleet there. So I do want to recognize and honor, um, share our condolences with the families um, of those lost on the FB coastal rain and mention that there are some GoFundMes to support the families who are um, suffering from a big loss right now. And up next, we're going to keep moving right along. Um, thank you to Jan and George. And up next is Rich, Rich Bard. The rumor is that uh, Rich just goes around in a halibut hoodie he found in a thrift store posing as fisherman so that he can jump into events like this and foist his preposterous poems and stories on unsuspecting audience is on YouTube and Zoom, but I know that's not quite right. And I look forward to hearing what Rich has to share. Thanks for being here. Hi, so what I'm gonna perform here is a fable, which is among a, a whole bunch of fables that seem to have been schooling up during this last pandemic year and they're just about to a book form. So this one's called Cats on Boats. On my first boat, before I'd even thought about fishing in Alaska, we had a cat while we trolled for salmon in Washington. The cat's name was Lesser Yarmouth, and it applied itself to the seven-step self-improvement program that most boat cats take up. There was one step where the cat imagined the tall wooden trolling poles were put there for it to climb like trees. Almost all the other steps, in one way or another, involved sleeping. We called the cat Lesser Yarmouth because the name Great Yarmouth was already taken. That was the name of the salmon troller we and the cat were fishing on. It was an old boat. There's a photo of it on its first job in Accutan, working as a supply boat for ships that were putting the hurt on the whale population out by the Aleutian Islands. I wondered if the cat's thinking had, like most of the world, evolved to disapproval of whale killing. Look at this, I said to the cat one evening at home during the off season. The American Pacific Whaling Company, which was the boss of the Great Yarmouth in Accutan, killed and chopped up almost 500 whales there one year. Horrible, huh? The cat didn't respond for quite a while. Then it opened an eye and said, I'm trying to get a nap here. I'll get back to you. But it never did. 
The American Pacific Whaling Company had a decent run, but times got tough and the Great Yarmouth was laid off. Um, excuse me, technical difficulties. When it comes down. The American Pacific Whaling Company had a decent run, but times got tough and the Great Yarmouth was laid off. By the time I came along, many years and several thoughtless owners later, rot and indifferent maintenance had reduced its value to next to nothing. I was glad for this. Next to nothing was exactly what I could afford. The boat came with free health care. In 1798, Congress had passed a law which let sailors go to a marine hospital to get medical help for free. Somehow, 180 years went by without any outrage about freeloaders. Then we had a president who saw freeloaders everywhere he looked. And so Ronald Reagan stopped the outrageous healthcare giveaway. He kicked out the doctors and closed all the hospitals. Sometimes I thought about what Thanksgiving would be like in the Reagan household. The family would be seated around a big table and a cousin down at the lower end would say, did you pass the dark meat? And Ronald Reagan would say, Go get a job and buy your own turkey, you freeloader bum. After a few fishing seasons went by, the cat added a step to its self-improvement program. When in port, going down the dock and hiding in hopes of not having to go back out on the ocean. Eventually, my partner adopted the same view of fishing as the cat. One year, she stayed on the beach and Lesser Yarmouth stayed with her. It was happy to be home in the summer, surrounded by real trees and grass and mice. We had some good years there, but over time the cat got old and run down and began to stay in bed all day in its pajamas. The happy ending would have been if the cat had met its end in contentment in its comfortable bed by the kitchen stove. We waited for some last words like, it's time I passed on into the next incarnation. I've had a good life, especially after I got off that darn boat. Bye now, love you. But the cat couldn't get to that point. It just kept looking a little more ragged and unhappy every day. The cat was miserable and needed help dying, but on the island where we lived, there was no vet to give it a shot. And it was hard to think of any other humane way out. Eventually, we decided that the cat might not hold it against us if we put it in a gunny sack with some rocks and into the saltwater bay by the house. It started out all right. The cat didn't object to be putting in, put in the sack and I took it to the bay's rocky edge and dropped it in. Then things went sideways. The water was pretty clear. And five feet down, I could see the knot at the sack's end come undone. And the cat came out moving its legs like crazy, like it was Ali Sheba racing down the home stretch in the 1997 Kentucky Derby. Then the cat stopped running and sank out of sight. It wasn't the greatest image to be left with after a nice long relationship. On the other hand, Ali Sheba did win the Derby that year. That's that table. And uh, just one more thing here. Here's the, here's the hoodie. Bye. Stay healthy, good fishing. Thank you, Rich. I know there are some other cats in the fleet. Um, I wanna shout out Halcyon, the troller cat from the Nerf. Um, Thanks again. I want to, I also want to mention that I've learned that the GoFundMe I mentioned is linked right on the Fisher Poets website. And there you'll also find uh, links to events happening tomorrow. Um, as Mo mentioned in her set, there are uh, a bunch of workshops and then there are also some gallery openings that are also doing some cool virtual options. I want to thank all the Fisher Poets organizers. Erica uh, is joining us now and since moving to Oregon has also supported the Fisher Poets organizing. And um, she was born in Kodiak, fished from all the way from Sitka to Bristol Bay, a bunch of different uh, participation in the fishery from canner or working in the canneries, I think, as well as catch and fish. Um, at 25, she went back to school and began a decade of environmental activism and work, which she shares with her family. And I'm really excited to have her here. I saw her 
make people blush in the voodoo room once. So I look forward to hearing what happens tonight. Thanks for being here. You're welcome, friend. So I've got three short pieces this evening. I'm so thankful that everyone put this on and joined us. Um, I come to you from Astoria, um, Clatsop Chinook land. And uh, this first one is called Seasons because this is just another season that we're going through. You have good seasons, you have bad seasons and we'll get through it. Not a fisherman anymore. As I stand and stare out from the shore, I won't go to sea, it's not for me. No, I'm not a fisherman anymore. Instead, I'll raise these babies, even though they occasionally drive me crazy. I'm cleaning the shoreline instead of pulling up ground line. My kisses mend bruises and scrapes of all kinds, quickly like my hands used to strip cork lines. I've learned signs beyond flipping the bird so I could teach my children the word for water, for food, for love. See, I want them to know just how far it can go if they care for the sea just like me, for the waters I've sailed on, for the ports that I've hailed from, for the fish on their plates when their dad's running late from towing someone safely to shore. No, I'm not a fisherman anymore. As a mom, I sing songs about packing along plastic bottles, old shoes, and used masks. And I know someday they will ask why I'm not a fisherman anymore. So this one is dedicated to all the dynamic duos on the back deck. You know, that deck hand that you find and you just get a groove. Um, this was published in the first edition of the Young Fisherman's Almanac. I didn't know it was published uh, until my dear friend sent me, a pic sent me a text message saying, hey, someone just walked into the coffee shop with a picture of me in my wedding dress in a bathroom stall. And I said, I, I, thought I, I thought I got permission. So it says, find yourself a good deckhand and stick with her. Rachel fished with me in Bristol Bay for three seasons, one on the FV Silverado, effectively a floating beer can with a lot of holes, and two on the FV Stargazer. We knew each other's mannerisms well enough to predict when the other would sneeze, or in my case, puke, while picking fish, and would grab a salmon from the other if we could see the problem in a fish basket while the opposite side of the net. We fished during the 32 cent base price for red season and the 80 cent years following. And we fished together in the years of snail mail when the bag phone was the only option and cost a dollar a minute. In the season, she chose a different kind of work. She'd send weekly letters and a couple care packages full of newspapers and magazines, knowing the connection to the outside world that I was most definitely craving. We'd also take on tasks that the other hated. For her, pulling the anchor. For me, climbing down into the fish hold after a delivery to retrieve salmon that missed the brailer bag. Having someone on deck next to you that's willing to swap scut work is priceless. But be careful, because you may end up in a bathroom stall many years down the road, finding yourself digging and holding up layer after layer of petticoats and tool while someone uses the head. Uh, as I said, I'm coming to you from Astoria and it has taken me a long time to get here. I first came here in 2003 during my first year ever living away from the ocean. I was doing my undergraduate at Southern Oregon University and um, I came here and it reminded me of like the dirty, gritty cannery row of Kodiak. And then um, I came to Fisher Poets in like 2006 and I said, oh yeah, this is for me. And I've been trying to make my way back here for a long time since. My partner Daniel is in the Coast Guard and we've been together for about 21 years on and off and Astoria's been on our bucket list. And we call this his twilight tour because he's at 22 years in the Coast Guard now and we finally made it to Astoria. And I figured my ode to Astoria, I could sing it to you tonight because we're all missing each other and we wish we were here in Astoria and hopefully next year we will all be together. 
been singing this song in the woods with my kids for about six months, but it's a little too late for my six-year-old to stay up. So it's just me tonight. Oh, Astoria, I'm coming home to you. Oh, Astoria, I am trying to get to you. Want to stand on the river where the water meets the blue. Oh, Astoria, I am coming home to you. Oh, Astoria, I want to get to you. Oh, Astoria, I am trying to see it through. Where the, sh oh, I'm trying to walk by the river where the ship's horns blew. Oh, Astoria, I'm coming home to you. Oh, Astoria, I have finally got to you. Now I live where the river meets the blue. Made my home right here on sunny South Slope. Oh, Astoria, I am never leaving you. I'm sending you all love from Astoria. I can't wait to see you in person next year. Love it, Erica. Thanks for singing. Uh, thanks for also for speaking so well to uh, the realities of being a Fisher mom. Um, shout out to the Fisher moms. I'm doing pulling a mobile stern and dipping my computer. And next, I want to welcome John Palms. John is uh, leading a workshop tomorrow. Uh, like I said, more information about that on the Fisher Poets website. Um, there's a little tab to the left. Check it out. See what's going on. Um, there's also movies to watch. But anyway, John fished as a hand troller around Elfin Cove near Glacier Bay National Park up in Alaska. He has written many songs saying he often channels Elvis Presley and sang along with his V8 Ford engine about what would, whatever was going around, around, going on around him. And these days gets a lot of inspiration from the Fisher Book Poets Gathering itself. So join John, write some songs tomorrow, but uh, here's a little taste. Thanks for being here, John. Thank you. And thanks to everybody. Wow. You know, I just feel so humble or so, I'm just so glad that you accept me as one of the Fisher Poets because really you're so good and you're so clever and you're all so authentic. And uh, so much thanks to Rich King for doing that Smitty poem, Rubber Hooks Divine. You know, that just, to me, that's what it's all about. You know, I hope we're all sharing each other's stuff for years after we're all gone. <laughs> so this first tune is inspired by Fisher Poets. Uh, a few years ago, there was a presentation on the fishing in the New Testament. And you know, four of the 12 apostles were fishermen. And I thought, wow, you know, that's something to think about. Why are we using this fish and fishing metaphor? And why is it so appropriate to this new religion? Joseph was a carpenter, but Jesus was a fisherman, the first of his disciples too. No accident at all. Out on the ocean, all men are brothers. Jesus was a fisherman, no accident at all. He said, launch out into the deep. Put down your nets, and they said, we've been fishing all night long, and we ain't caught nothing yet. But when the same was pursed, and brailing was complete. They plugged every fish boat on the Sea of Galilee. When it was time to feed the multitudes that listened to him speak, Jesus knew just what to do. It was no accident at all. Yes, he knew just what to do when there were thousands to be fed. He multiplied the humpies and the pilot bread. Now when some folks talk of heaven, they point up to the sky, but the ocean is the closest thing you'll see until you die. No beginning and no end. 
She always will provide unforgiving of greed and pride. Was no accident that Jesus was a fisherman, the first of his disciples, too. No accident at all. Out on the ocean, all that our brothers, Jesus was a fisherman. No accident at all. You know, one thing I was thinking about when I was trying to think of verses for the song, I was thinking, Jesus, get back in the boat. <laughs> I couldn't let that pass. So um, this next tune is written, where was, I was listening to a 371, I think it was, engine that was running that boat, and we were coming from Ketchikan past Lincoln Rock. It's about Lincoln Rock on the way to Myers Chuck. Spent a lot of time by myself. Far away, far away, far away across the beautiful ocean. Am I bound to sail all alone? Far away across the beautiful sea. Like a moth to a flame, like a moth a flame I was drawn to your love in the night like a dream far away far away far away across the beautiful ocean am I bound to sail all alone storm. I was tired and searching for shelter. I found more in your arms. Now you're gone. Far away, far away, far away across the beautiful ocean. Am I bound to sail all alone, far away across the beautiful sea, far away across the beautiful sea? You can download all these things free on johnpalms.nervous. Okay, <laughs> fine. Thank you, John. Thank you so much, two beautiful ones. Again, John has a workshop tomorrow. Uh, you can go jam with him. And for those of you who don't know, this is not, or who haven't been yet to Astoria, this is not quite how Fisher Poets typically works. Um, typically you have to pick and choose who you get to see. So we are really blessed um, to be able to see everybody over these three days. And if you are just joining us, there is another set tomorrow night, six o'clock. But for now, it's really an honor and a treat to introduce my good friend, Maggie Birch. Maggie is calling in from Washington tonight, but she grew up set netting on the Ugashic River in Bristol Bay. And now she runs her own drift gill netter up there, the F.E. Georgette Rose. She's in occupational therapy school and has written many a Fisher poetry at her young age, given her lifelong fishing career, including this beautiful little zine called Broken Water. I heard it's limited edition, but maybe you can get your hands on it. Thanks for being here, Maggie. Look forward to hearing you. Hi. Um, so good to be here in this community tonight. Um, I just can't say how much it means to me to hear all your voices right now and just know you guys are all out there and thinking about the water and um yeah I'm just really uh feel fortunate to be a part of this uh tonight um this poem I'm gonna read is called a sestina it the type of poem 
is Asestina, and the poem is called From Water. We differ, my friend and I, in what we look for in a boat. He wants performance, and I want a bunk for the nanny. He wants a jet and step, and I want refrigerated seawater. We do not differ in what we fear, because we both fear failing. He does not tell me this, but I see it in his shoulders. Along with failure, I fear compromise. Is that what it means to be a woman? Compromise? Even a woman with her own boat, even a woman tougher than the sea who wears men's clothes because of big shoulders. My mother was a woman like that, and I had a nanny. I don't believe that meant she was failing, but as a child, I had a fantasy, my mother was water, that I was born from the water, that I was raised on pirate ships and made no compromise. I'd pretend I sailed those ships through storms so big the masts were failing. Then I would hear her call. Then I would hear the call of my nanny and jump off into the grass, my jacket slung over my shoulder. Now some days I feel the weight of a gender on my shoulders when I am one of the only women on the water and because in the winter I put away my boat to be a nanny. My pride is tied up in the hall without a lot of room for compromise. My pride is tangled into every line on that boat and I lie in bed thinking of what hydraulic hose is closest to failing. I look to the women before me who face the fear of failing. And if I know anything, it is because I stand on their shoulders. I have listened to their legends or secrets or worked on their boat. Women who are mothers and have broken the water, who carry anchors and car seats and sharp knives and compromise. Do you give up the helm, bring the baby along, get a nanny? So here I am looking for a boat with a bunk for the nanny, banking on a few more years without my birth control failing, bracing for the day I will face compromise like a wet wind, the day I will carry someone else on my shoulders as we head to the water or to the boat. My friend crawls into the forecastle and I tell him that bunk is too small for his shoulders. He says he's not, he says it's got a good engine and it's worth the compromise. I think of his mother who gave up the sea to create him, to raise him from water. Thank you. Um, I'm just gonna read one more that is kind of, there's like comfort foods. And I feel like this to me is a comfort poem. And um, it's about my parents, round, soft flannel movement, slow, old memories like bones buried in boxes made into shelves, one round wood room, two old fishermen, still lovers, round in the way they are soft, soft flannel movement barely letting the water foul in through the windows, soft bones, round glass, found on open beaches where the skies howl, soft moans, old whispers, in the vowels of the tree songs there are secrets their ears know, secrets only old bones know, backs broken by wind, hands hollowed by weight, souls torn by weather, ode to hold me, ode to old fishermen lying on flannel, holding each other, holding memories, holding stones. Thank you guys so much. It's been such a big honor and I love you all. Can't wait to see you next year and have a beer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Thank you, Maggie. Um, we have over 300 people zooming in on YouTube. And I just want to thank all the organizations that have helped get us, uh, helped us get the word out about Fisher Poets yeah. in the past, particularly um, KMUN, Coast Community, and uh, the Astorian. 
and um, the coast uh, weekend as well. Um, another outfit change, uh, shout out to everybody who fed us this year during a really tough pandemic, um, fishermen included, but also all the Washington right. fruit pickers. Okay, um, we have Gino Leach who has a little background noise. Gino, you gotta tell the room to be quiet while you perform. Um, and Gino's coming in from Chinook, Washington. Uh, he has done drag fishing out of Astoria and performed with Fisher Poets since 1995. Is that right? Thanks for being here. Uh, You're up, go uh, right ahead. Maria Rock. Yeah. yeah, I'm up here at Rob and Tiffany Sides' place. They, they just moved up a uh, place uh, overlooking the uh, bridge span on the Astoria Bridge. Yeah, they're in uh, Bond Street Heights up here, so it's a pretty nice place. Anyway, this one uh, goes back to about 78, 79. I wrote it not then, but anyway, it's kind of the time period. It's when uh, you, you couldn't uh, just go out there and hard nose it sometime. Well, anyway, it's called uh, the Pink Orange Glow. Well, she idled across a breaking bar, casting a sodium glow. The lump was 10 to 14 feet with an occasional buffalo. The crew were wedged in heaving bunks. Grime pillows drank their drool. The clammy quilts were a patchwork stink of bait and brine and fuel. While the skipper's wash rock fissured face glowed green in the dashboard lights, it passed more lighthouses and telephone poles. He was a hard case, stick and stay guy. He slurped scalded fishboat folders from a varicose vein white mug. Zippo, zumpteenth camel, kept an eye on an inbound tug. They found a hole in a lump and throttled up a howling 6110. The boat gave a buck. She banged, she rolled, and shipped green water again. He ran offshore, sniffed out his string, painted Norwegian green and gloss white. And foaming black seas, buoys, danced, dove, and teased in the pink orange glow, the sodium lights, the grogged, cowlick crew rolled out of the bunks. The boat wallowed deep in the trough. Silent, sullen, they pulled on dank boots. A question, the lives they had rot. Drunk with sleep on a rolling back deck, their lungs dragged in diesel exhaust, shining like seals in moss green heli hansons. They meat axe crab bait and swung out the block. Well, the skipper climbed the rust blistered starboard ladder, took the helm on a flying bridge, disc bulged and burned in his lower back, cigarette drowned in his lips. Rain shotgunned the greased yellow hood of his uniroyal jacket. The rigging started to sing. It was a southerly moan and the hydraulics drone. They line the boat up on a string. Well, in the back deck, sea sprayed night shadow. The block man dug his gut in a rubber, rubber wrap rail. He hooked a diving trailer buoy as he leaned in the teeth of the gale. He fired a bamboo buoy stick back on deck with blue, blue glove soup bone fist and horse to fathom a slack and taut yellow crab line with a gunny sack back and wrought iron wrist. The crab block shiv raced like a meat slicer, snatched the line from his hands. 
The sea boiled white around his black red ball boots. He put the snooze to the block and lifted the ramp. The skipper throttled up, exhaust belts black from the stack. The hydraulics howled and the decks was a wash. And breaking the surface in 45 fathom, the lid straps bulged on a dungeon-esque pot. Well, their crew wore splitting mauled grins as they landed the pot. The boat heaved, she rolled, and she pitched, and she tossed. They sorted and baited, and let her go on a roll. They had one down, 500 to go. And they danced on a string in the pink-orange glow. Thank you. Amazing as always, Gino. Thank you. Thanks to the sites for making that happen. It's great to glad you're all together. Okay. Um, up next, pretty exciting. We have a greenhorn in the room. Um, this is Tony's first Fisher Poets gathering. Um, I know she's looking forward to making the trip trek up to Oregon, um, hopefully in 2022 now. Um, Tony uh, grew up in a Croatian American fishing family up near me in Everett, Washington. And uh, the family boat was the Western Maid, a 76 foot purse singer. She's the author of six books of poetry and prose. Uh, a new book, Spellhaven, is forthcoming from Counterpoint Press. So look out for that. Um, if we were in, really in Astoria, I would make the room cheer the whole time until Tony made it to the mic. So I would love to see some exclamation points in the chat, welcoming um, our first time reader, Tony. Thanks for being here. Well, you, you have made it so nice. So um, thank you so much, Elma. You know, um, my wife and I love Astoria. We go up there a lot. And uh, uh, we were up there a couple of years ago and we were having coffee at the Coffee Girl down in that um, cannery down, down the way, down the railroad track. And we walked through the cannery pier and um, that, that cannery. And there was a guy that I started talking to who was selling fish. And he uh, started to talk to me about the Fisher Poets. And um, um, I talked to him about fishing history and family. And he said, you know, you should come on up. So I uh, got in contact with a man named John Broderick who um, has been so lovely. And uh, so he invited me and um, Amanda and uh, Amanda and uh, Elma, thank you for all of that, for, for making me welcome. So, um, uh, my father's boat, the fish, the Western Maid. Um, it actually it uh, uh, was dredged up out of Coos Bay in 2017, so it's had its last voyage. But um, uh, growing up, uh, my father fished up in uh, Dutch Harbor in the Bering Sea, and uh, out, out outside of um, the Northwest waters. And he uh, would bring home prizes like uh, um, uh, you know the glass flo glass floats, or sometimes uh, a um, walrus tusk um so i'm but he also brought home fish right lots of fish so um i'm going to read about another type of prize he brought home um i'm gonna re i have a book um a few years back called pink harvest it has a picture of the shrimp um uh, fishing that um it's hard to see i know but um the piece is called uh, the prize inside get a fish snapper or lingcod Packerel or halibut, mackerel or halibut, an everyday fish, a regular fish, not a special fish, not albacore or swordfish or salmon, too fancy for this common dish. Put the fish in a soup pot, cover it with water, let it come to a slow boil like your mother's slow boil as she waits for your father's fishing boat to come in, for his ship to come in, for him to make good on his promise to fix the leaky gutters this time he's in port. Cook until the juices of the fishes are released, then simmer. The simmering goes on for minutes or hours or days for weeks or months or years. Fish is simmering on the stove forever from cradle to grave. The fish simmers and simmers and at some point is done. Lift the fish out to place it on a platter. 
As you lift, the meat falls away from the bones, millions of bones, the ribs, the spine, the long bones, the short, the flat bones, the small bones around the cheeks like lace work, the intricate system of delicate, delicate bones. And now the need to pray to Saint Blaise, patron saint of things caught down the wrong pipe. And now the need to go to church and have the priest draw two white candles across your neck and bless your throat so the bones won't get caught and choke you to death. And once blessed, tell me, your mother will say, how can you swear like you do, like your father swears? How can you say, yabem, fuck? So easily that foul language rolls off your tongue. What remains in the pot is fish stock, golden broth that can cure all, a sore throat, a sore life, a salty cure. Now add potatoes, cubed, or rice and peas like the Italians, reezy beezy, that's what you say, and simmer until the rice is cooked up and puffed up and the air smells salt sweet, perfumed by the sea. Place the platter on the dinner table, on display. You listen with your sisters on either side while your father talks ab about all the other slabs, about the lack of money, the lack of fish, about who's getting screwed, yabem, yabem, yabem. Hear your mother slip in something about the weather, the forecast for rain, the gutter. See your father gaze out the window at the horizon, just outside calling him, though he's only been in port one day. Today in school, you learned about Christopher Columbus. Did he too have the same look standing at the helm on the lookout for the new world? You play around with what's left on your meal. Why does it take them so long to eat? And finish everything on your plate, she'll say, and then you sit and then you wait. On the platter, all that's left are the bones, the backbone like the one you see in the cartoons where the cartoon cat tips over the trash can in this alley and pulls out the fish spine with only the head and the tail intact. Here, there's no escaping the face, the open mouth, the eye looking upward toward heaven or the ceiling light. It was living and now it's dead and you focus in on the white eye like the pupilless eyes of the zombies you saw in the science fiction film, The Night of the Living Dead. Zombies who look just like regular townspeople the day before. The mailman, the neighbor, the school nurse. Then the next day, they were walking with their arms stretched out in front of them, coming to claim you, coming your way. You look at the eye, covet it, think to yourself, it's not a crime what's about to happen next. The fish no longer uses his eyes to evade the neck, net, the hook, to see whatever it is a fish sees. The fish is blind to what will happen next, the soul already gone, as we are blind to what will happen tomorrow and the next day and the next, blind to what lies just around the bend. And now begins the arguing, the fight every time, who gets the prize and who got it last, and you always get your way and you're a lying cheat. For the fish only has two eyes, and there are three daughters, and someone will be left out. Someone always gets left out. But tonight I'm the lucky one. Tonight I get an eye. When I put the eye in my mouth, it tastes salty and fishy and good. And when I chew it, it's a little chalky. Remember, she says, don't tell your school at friends, your friends at school about the eyes. I chew and I and chew. It's not the taste I covet. It's the prize inside the eye, inside where we cannot see. When the white is gone, there it is, the clear round center, as tiny as a small glass bead. If you hold it up and look closely, it's like looking inside a clear globe. And there you'll see a sea and sky. And there I spy a boat and there a sea full of fish. And in this world, the sea is always calm and the sky is always clear. And if I could vault this life into the world inside the eye, my vision would expand. I could see into the future. I could see beyond the kitchen table, beyond the house, to the world past this life. And what's that out there, Captain? Just around the bend. And what's that out there, Captain? Just beyond the horizon's edge. Thank you. Well, Tony, I think I speak on behalf of 
all the Fisher poets that we would be thrilled to welcome you back. No greenhorn at all. That was amazing. Thank you so much for joining us. Great job, Tom Hilton, on uh, recruiting somebody new. I'm super blessed to have a bunch of uh, visual artists as well in my set tonight. Uh, one of those is our next performer, Duncan Berry from Otis, Oregon, who makes prints from creatures of the land, sea, and air um, from where he lives in the UN Cascade Head Biosphere Reserve. Sorry, that's a little bit of a handful for my mouth at this hour. But um, Duncan, we're so glad to have you. And if you want to check out some of his art, you can do that at the River Sea Gallery in Astoria. Um, they also have a little bit of an online option this year. Uh, Duncan grew up uh, on his family's troller out of the Columbia River and then went on to found a series of companies at the intersection of business and the environmental movement. And as I said, um, he lives now near the mouth of the Salmon River on the central Oregon coast. So Duncan, you have the mic. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Emma. Thanks for the, the great show. And thanks for being our illustrious MC tonight. I love your, uh, I love your costume changes. Uh, so, you know, all of us that live here at the coast uh, in this dark winter, uh, look forward to this ray of sunshine that is the Fisher Poets Gathering, um, especially this winter with ice and snow and the winds over the last 24 hours, it's just, uh, it just lifts our spirits. Um, I'm gonna spend my five minutes uh, talking about uh, two seasons on the ocean. One, a poem about um, the winter uh, and the, I'm sorry, actually about the summer and a sea shanty, a little more rollicking uh, one uh, on uh, winter time and the crab season that we're having right now. So, uh, the poem first. So every single one of us that fishes depends upon the upwelling uh, and what it brings us, the gifts it gives us. And so that upwelling for, for uh, those of you that don't live here is an incredible north wind that blows, starts up in June, blows trillions of gallons of, of water south. And uh, just like your toilet bowl, all those waters move outwards into the Pacific and they act like this giant pump and they pull this deep nutrient rich water in close to shore. And when they hit the shore, boom, they, they, uh, they burst into life and uh, all hell breaks loose. So this poem is about that upwelling. And it's also dedicated to the flexibility and resilience of all my fellow human beings during this radical time of change we're all going through. So here's upwelling. North wind blowing cold and hard there on the dull gray horizon under the fog bank the surface of the sea torn and pushed away from its anchoring shore. Deep waters stirring, pulled upwards out of the dark, bearing all that is drifted down from above. Rich broth of all that remains of the once vibrant life of the sea, bull kelp and gray whale, cormorant, all falling to their place of rest during winter. Rising up now, pulled to the surface by summer winds, gathered remains of the past transformed and fueling the greatest flagrant buffet table feeding frenzy on the planet, fueling the explosion of phytoplankton so vast they can be seen from space. They gather into a great green fire raging on the surface of the sea, zooplankton rising out of their sandy beds, eaten by the eulican and sand lance and herring, eaten by salmon and albacore, eaten by the ever hungry alpha predator human. And here inside of me, this compost of past pain, joys, secrets, forgotten, forgotten impulses, all falling like a soft rain into my depths. As in me, all that has seemingly died or was lost is rising up, feeding this tide of change, these unfolding, unbidden shifts in me. What was becoming what is. These winds and currents of my unsettled and fresh new life upwelling. So uh, that, that's my uh, serious few moments. And now I'm gonna turn to uh, a shanty. Uh, whenever I uh, do so, I need to do a little costume change though. Uh, this one goes out to uh, 
Mike Shirley, uh, who is our dock master at Fish People Seafood out in Iwako, and uh, is um, is uh, also to the all the the crab boats that bring us um, their incredible crab or their uh, their dungies each year, and um, so most of you know about octopus, yeah, but uh, not many of you probably know they're of man. This is hard to get on uh, when you're sitting down. Um, so most of you don't know that they're uh, of the mollusk family. Yeah, clams. So uh, if you've ever crabbed, you know that a crab's favorite meal is a razor clam and has been for millions of years. Well, this is a story of one of those clams that dropped its shell, grew legs, and had revenge on its mind. For in a simple twist of fate, an octopus's favorite meal is a dungeness crab. So uh, if you feel like singing along, please do. This one's about Metacarcinus magister. It's called the the Ballad of Dungy Boy. Well, Metacarsonus Magister is a samurai of the sea, armored up with ten strong legs and just as proud as he can be. Well, Mr. Dungy Boy, you finally met your match, for there's a big old eight-legged octopus gonna wolf you down his hatch, gonna wolf you down his hatch. Well, we're working a line of parts along the 20 fathom line, searching for our double boys and that sodium vapor shine. God has a sense of humor that much is crystal clear. For why would he make crabs fill out at the worst time of the year? Lines are spinning in the block, pots swaying to and fro. Here's 20 more crusty boys and down the chute they go. Swells are coming in, high as a house, wind screaming in our ears. When suddenly the pots come up empty, feeding the worst of our fears. Hey, someone's beat us to the punch, boys, taking no prisoners and leaving no trace. I bet it's one of them eight leggers down below with a big smile on his face. Well, four pots later up, he finally comes, our creepy, crawly, bright red octopus, James. He lets out one hell of a crabby burp and he looks me straight in the eye and winks. Looks me straight in the eye and winks. Well, word up on the street about you, Octo. Word of your squidward, tentacool, and octoraptor fame. Humans in their boats playing the El Pulpo apocalypse cracking game. Sticks and stones, they can't break your bones. Psycho mantis, squicken, octobroster, craptopus, inky peat, flumpy dumpster, no. Because, Mr. Dungy Boy, you have finally met your match. But there's a big old eight-legged octopus going to wolf you down his hatch. Going to wolf you down his hatch. Thank you, fellow Fisher poets. And uh, look forward to seeing you in Astoria in the flesh and wearing our skins. Nice uh, costume change, Duncan. Yeah. Um, you're pretty good at that. Uh, I am wearing um, Amber Webb. Uh, I also have her Sedna print up here behind me. Um, and this is by Oceana Willis. I don't want to leave that out. But first, I am really excited, or first, second, whatever, here we are, night, round and about nine o'clock. I'm uh, very excited to welcome my friend Tella, another Bellingham Fisher gal. Um, Tella is a lifelong salmon troller based out of Sitka, Alaska. She's fished the FV Nurka with her partner Joel since 2006 and self markets their catch from here in Washington with uh, Nurka sea frozen salmon. So, Tella, as always, I'm just glad to see your smiling face even through the screen. And uh, thank you so much for sharing. Ah, all right. Thanks, Elma. Um, I'm just going to jump right into it, buddies. Uh, this is a story from last August, and it's called Dog Days. Jonathan's voice breaks through the deck speaker. You there, Greg? You have time for a story? Our code group is in the late afternoon doldrums of a skinny salmon season. 12 hours in, trying to keep our eyes open for another few, hoping for a night bite. Greg's just made a cup of tea. He has time. Okay, it's a sad story, 
but it's a good one. Jonathan hasn't been on the radio much today. He sounded distracted, not on the fish like he usually is. Now we learn he's been on the satellite phone with his wife. Laura had to put their dog down today. In person, we might circle grief with clumsy comfort, but radio talk is an accepted monologue for as long as the speaker keys the mic. You don't need to know what to say. You just listen. Five days into a king trip weary, Jonathan free ranges memory. He recalls the trip to the pound a few years into their marriage. He was skeptical. We're not going to find anything here. It's all old, barky, broken down dogs. But then, hang on, look at that one. The young Weimaraner pointer mix had good bones and soft ears, and she looked them in the eye. They were back for her the next day. Fancy grew into a family dog with their daughter's births. She was Laura's companion when Jonathan was fishing and his running partner when he was home. That was a tell of her slow decline. After years leaping for the door at seeing jogging clothes, Elder Bensie glanced up but stayed down. They had known the end was coming. Still, our friend wonders, how do you really know it's time to make that final call and send these family members across the rainbow bridge? 16-year-old Bensi told them the time was now in the August King opening with Jonathan 900 miles from home off the Southeast Alaska coast. Laura and the girls said his goodbyes with their own. Jonathan thanks Greg for listening. I feel better getting to tell you about her. I know you've been there too. And now it's Greg's turn. Georgie lived with Father Nicholas until deciding he'd rather be across the street with Greg and Amy. When Georgie's legs gave out, they wheelbarrowed him through the neighborhood so everyone could send him off. Joel and I exchanged crumpled looks. We put Bear the Boat Cat down in Sitka two years ago. We ran aimlessly offshore after, away from the fleet and the fish. Our grief cruise, we called that lost day. Listening to our friends' disembodied voices, soft as morning doves, Joel shakes his head. I love this group. This group is easy to love. A trio steady as our small boats. The relief of people you can be human with heightens how rare that feels these days. As the looming election further fractures a pandemic isolated land world, the peace we have out here is as sacred as the uncomplicated, unconditional love of a good dog. Five hours from now, a gale will rip through the harbor. We'll be up all night on anchor watch. It'll be the worst night of our season, the one we refer back to as a marker of doubt in the cost benefit analysis of commercial fishing, inspiring one of our group to later say, I'm going to have a stiff drink and consider my life choices. But we're not there yet. For now, the ocean is calm with a few fish yet to catch and two gentle men casting lines of kinship and compassion. When the sun finally sinks, pink and gold echo their eulogies. We watch the day pass. To Bensie, we say, and to Georgie and Bear and all the beloved creatures who teach us how to be human and that a sad story may also be a good one. I wanna thank um, Jonathan and Laura for giving this story their blessing. And I wanna thank you for all of you being here and um, with us and we miss you. And um, I hope that you have had a source of comfort to carry you through this last year, whether it is one like that or whatever suits you. And um, 
we love you and we'll see you uh, next year in Astoria. Thanks, Alma. Bye. Yes. Oh, so good to honor all creatures that are uh, part of this life with us. Um, I also want to just take a moment to thank the performers that make this possible. Um, it is, as Mo said, during her set, a little tricky to commit to being on Zoom uh, like this or even to, uh, it's kind of scary to read in Astoria too. So good job everybody for doing that. We have some lifers in here, but some new folks and I just, um, we organized a Fisher Poets on Bellingham Bay up here. Um, thanks mar largely to Buck Malloy and the Sea Feast team. Um, and it just means a lot to have all of you sign up uh, and jump in this with us. So thank you so much. Our next performer is Philip, who uh, has worked in marine mechanics as an, and as an electrician. He also sang in Southeast Alaska in the late eighties and Gilnet for, uh, Salmon in Norton Sound. Herring. Actually, herring. Herring, yeah. I wrote salmon and I was like, that's wrong. Um, in 1993, he's calling in from Seattle tonight. Yeah, well, greetings, everyone. And, and to all you people out there uh, watching on YouTube, come down, come down, down next, uh, next year and, and join us at the Fisher Poets Gathering in Astoria. It is a great party. I look forward especially to breakfast and and uh, and party conversations in in the Riverwalk Lounge. Three three short um, slice of fishing poems. First one dead and my favorites. Dead humpies rotting in the bilge and the batteries stinking and the weather dirty and the antidote. I don't get seasick, just luck of the draw, but that time running south out of Chatham Straits in dirty weather and the skipper had me filling the batteries in the sweltering engine room and the smells of battery acid and leaking diesel fumes and hot oil and of the two dead humpies we later washed out of the bilge under the engine, I was getting a bit lightheaded. But then it was time to sack out up there with my head next to the knee in my forecastle lower bunk and the bow slamming up and down an easy ten feet, and I had started out queasy. But we all know how to deal with these things. Just thinking about my then girlfriend, lecherous male lizard brain even gets a hint of procreation, even from cerebral cortex fantasies, and it yells to that queasy stomach, priority, priority, go back to sleep. But you all, being Fisher persons, know how that is. Amorous thoughts quell queasiness. Number two. Kids go missing. A deep bay on the outside of Doll Island. Mossy cliffs, rocks, barnacles big as baseballs, mussels seven inches long. We're waiting for an opening, which is where and when Fish and Game says we can put nets in the water. Such interstices hold micro saner vacations. A few teens from other saners go exploring in a rubber raft with a small outboard. I snorkel for abalone. Evening comes, they don't come back. Our boat doesn't join in the search. We watch a long line of lights sweeping off the shore. It's the next morning. We're anchored near the south side. There is a cave mouth just about right in front of us. Out of it comes the rubber raft, the three young guys rowing. Our skipper radios the other boats. The kids explain, we went in to explore. A wave tipped the raft, the motor sank. It was too rough to get out. They spent the night on a sandy shelf. One kid's uncle might have been Fred, radios, thank God he's safe. I'm going to kill him. 
and the last one if I can get these pages separated yes uh, herring fishing Cape Danby Norton sound and ice the natives were all lining up and laughing at my brother David out chopping at ice flows surrounding his boat the flows surrounded all the boats David chopping at ice with a hatchet hell even I thought it was funny the chunks of ice blown in by a west wind the smallest chunks smallish chunks around the boats small enough to drift without grinding into the shallows where we anchored and then if you let the twin cameras hooked to your bicameral brain or here to your imagination pan backwards in time so you're looking out beyond the beach of this west facing cove with its hundred stranded fishermen mostly natives beyond the small ice and the boats is a higher wall of bergs whose keels hang up on the shelf and thus can't make it into shallower waters huge ice all wind compacted against this shore a mile of impassable crags before open water and my brother hitting at it with a hatchet thank you thank you i will say it is a, quite a treat to see in everyone's um zoom room it looks like you have a really fun interesting shop back there philip thank you for those um well i'm super excited to welcome katie bursch katie uh gave me a job a couple of years ago and it's been a real treat um learning from her and her family in Bristol Bay. We have a mother-daughter duo. Katie's following um, Maggie a couple sets later tonight. So that's pretty fun for the Ugashic folks in the room. And uh, Katie, so Katie started, got her first fishing job in 1983 after walking the docks in Kodiak. Uh, she loaded up a boat with halibut that year and since then has mostly been set netting in Bristol Bay. Tonight, she's gonna do a little mixed media, share some of the commercial fishing themed art that she's been making. You might have seen it already on the Fisher Poets website. A lot of the headers there um, are Katie's dioramas that are featured in Homer this winter. Um, she's gonna show us some and share some writing as well. So thanks, Kate, great to see you. Hey, everybody. Um, yeah, here's one of my little pieces I have here. It's in an extra tough box. Guys, these are the kind of boots we get when we fish in Alaska mostly. And so I just find these boxes and I make little little scenes and stuff. This, this one is about being a crew member. And it's kind of like once you die, if you get to come back to earth, what are you going to do? So this box is about kind of all the earthly pains and injuries we get as fishermen. And this little fisherman has a fish pick and a little brace on its wrist because maybe they have some tendonitis and maybe the scale hit their head. They have a bandage here and there's a little Vicky here on the belt. So we'll put this crew member in this box, this box has lots of things that remind me of all the pains and injuries that come over the years. But if we die, we might want to come back and we might miss things about fishing. So that's what this poem's about. Will I miss the clench of muscle and blood, the twitch and twist of tails? Life 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 on deck the promise of travail i didn't respect the vicky my thumb it has a slice how will i pick those fish i think as it throbs throughout the night my feet they live in rubber no skipper shoes for us fat chance fair toes to mold you go past the decinex but we'd miss the clench of muscle and blood, the twitch and twist of tails, life, life, life on deck, 
the promise of travail. My vertebrae are screaming and I don't know what to do. I won't say nothing to the skipper because he'll just get another crew. My hands go numb from elbows down. Keep me from my sleep. Buck up, get tough. Keep moving fast. It's only two more weeks. Yet I'll miss the clench of muscle and blood, the twitch and twist of tails. Life, life, life on deck, the promise of travail. We'll put this little guy to bed for the night. And the next one is in a fish box with styrofoam, kind of like you'd send your family some fish. And in here we have a little drift boat I made from a cork. And my crew member, Jacob Easton, made these cool little fish skeletons on his 3D printer. And then we got a fisherman down here. And I sewed up some bibs for that fisherman. And this one is called Flounder Zone. Gotta turn my page. Gotta get down here. For this one, getting down. <laughs> Flounder zone. The barrier between the atmosphere and the brine. Well, we know this interface. Pulling through it our prey, our prophet. We raise fish to their deaths. Yea, by mishap, one of ours slips, falls into that world of wet. We rub our eyes with trine to see beneath the veil where flatfish for flourish and amphipods stretch their fetal curve. Our hulls hiss with passing silt as we search Relentlessly, the tide sucks brown water down this broad bay, broken by bars. Thank you so much, everyone. It's great to see you all and looking forward to Astoria. Aw, oh, Katie, thank you so much. Um, I really do welcome everybody to check out the Bunnell Street Art Center website in Homer. You can see uh, many more of Kate's uh, fishing dioramas. I uh, used to fish in the New Chigak, um, with right near John Broderick and his family. And when I switched to Ugashik, I was nervous and really sad that I was gonna miss uh, perhaps music night. But when I had Katie on the phone in February talking about switching rivers in Bristol Bay, she's like, oh yeah, we do poetry night when it's slow. And I was like, whew, I'm going to make it. So anyway, thanks, Kate, for sharing. Up next, we have a duo performing together in uh, on the Kenai somewhere. I'm not sure which home they're in. But uh, Steve Schoonmaker and Clark Whitney are going to do their set together. So we've got a 10 minute block here or so. Um, Steve is an Alaska fisherman of 39 years and a fisher poet of 13. Um, I have seen him really rip up the dance floor at Kala before, so <laughs> excited to have him back. And um, Clark has fished 20 seasons as a drift gill netter in Bristol Bay. He lives on the Kenai and still fishes off and on in Cook Inlet as a crew member for both Drift and Set. So thank you both, glad to see you. Uh, take it away. Thanks, Elmo. You look quite lovely tonight. And the little screen I see. Uh, well, this piece I just wrote, uh, this is dedicated to a, a deceased mentor of mine. Uh, and I'm gonna read this piece. It's called Big Will. In memory of Will and Margie Tillion. Not so much measured in money or credations degrees, more like satisfied answers to what's been asked in the breeze. To what's been asking myself, yes, my real properties, 
in my muscular youth of the 1980s. Land's End met Fresh Bay in its postcard of peaks when its harbor was still small, mostly still small boat fleet. Yes, and I was a young man of such simple means as I sensed from inside with this fisherman in me. Back when the beach fires were frequent with all the hippies around, with all the driftwood house spit rats before the icicle plant burned down. Yeah, but that's another story. I'm just describing those scenes of such simple means when life was my living room, when my life was a dream. I drove off the trusty Tusty, our Mahdi State Ferry with my brown Chevy pickup, a 1958 Apache, up the compass rose from Kodiak with this fisherman and me. Guess I drove into Homer at the request of the stars and I parked at the bar quite conspicuously so an old friend might see that I was at Alice's with this fisherman and me. That's when Janet came in because she just happened to see my old 58 pickup as she came down the street. And there at Togiak St. Job, she landed for me. And returning to Homer, their skiff man to be with Janet and El Ray on the Moxon team. Steel 32, maybe nine foot in beam. Everything then of such simple means, reflected in bays so wild mountain green. Seen in Kamishak, seen in Kachemak, yeah, that was the scene. It was hand pursed and snag skips, cassette tapes in those days, when deck speakers spoke George Thorogood to our grinding away, saying, move it on over to the bay stormy clean, to the seabirds and the brown bears where the beaches meet streams. Sang with the squeal of the sand winch to her money bags lean, flopping and splashing to the gulls eagerly. That's when I met Big Will in that time like a dream, an old friend of El Ray's who introduced him to me somewhere around July 1983. Will Tillian of the Halibut Cove clan was a strong, always kindly, often seldom seen man who wore quietly his obvious intelligence under wire rim glasses cap and slightly long brown hair. Probably in his old wool halibut jacket, sleeves cut off just above the oversized forearms and hands. Will standing broadly in big rubber boots. When Big Will chuckled, I saw a fisherman, classic with no chrome. Will took me on crew on a trip out west for a 72 hour halibut opening at some mandatorily unmentionable location where there are white wood halibut schooners and fish. We loaded up Will and Margie's 44 foot fiberglass bolt the old squaw. Somewhere around about 58 hours into that opening, I dozed off on the stool while coaling ground line. And Will was right beside me at the rail. He grabbed my nodding off head. He looked at me and said, so, so you still wanna be a fisherman? That fall, Will and Margie moved out to Nuka Island and they set up home there with their two boys in the historic Harry and Pete's old house in the way back of Home Cove. Margie and the boys were often left there alone while Will and I fished for Tanner Crab in the outer district with the moody golf storms and the moody golf rains, so many inches a day. When it's too rough for any delivery to pay, so it's safety over debt. And at Home Cove we slept as the rain on the sea got down to a depth. It intaked into the fish hole of the tank down crabs we'd kept. So we threw them back into pots and then back over the side, trying to keep them alive, just to watch the sea otters dive into those plug pots and feast. And Big Will says to me, so, still want to be a fisherman? Off Wild Yellick Point, we were just one lone boat with all the arms of Nuka. One time, Will and I were setting gear at night, long lining conical pots, Will was driving from the flying bridge and I was dancing on deck with the gear, you know, coil, pop, coil, pop, coil, pop, coil, pop. Then now goes the anchor line and buoy. That's when I noticed my gloved hands were sparkling seized phosphorescence and the prop wash off the stern hurled phosphorescent fireballs into the calm beauty bay, which was reflecting the sky dancing crazily with green Northern lights. And I hear Will yell up from the bridge. So I knew what he's gonna say. So you still wanna be a fisherman? That was the frame of the whole game. Not much measured in money or credentials degrees, more like satisfied answers once asking the breeze 
Yes, of our real properties. Come what may, come what may. Like when Big Will just said so. And I knew what he was going to say. Does he still want to be a fisherman? Which refrains to this very, very day. Thanks. Here comes Clark Whitney Jr. All right, this is a song that I wrote a long time ago. It's about a foolish man who doesn't like to spill his coffee. It's a true story. All the way, Bristol Bay, that's where I'll stay. In the summertime, fishing for the salmon. Now as a lad of 25 in the spring of 83, I flew into King Salmon, my old boat for the sea. I didn't know the engine was rusted good and tight. Had to get her down to double end where the chief could make her right. Down the river my dad towed us, came too close to the rocks. But a 20 foot tide pushed us up to the outside of the dock. On the deck and in the warehouse where they used to store cans came the boat rights and mechanics i'd say it was all hands all the way bristol bay that's where i'll stay in the summertime fishing for the salmon now just outside the warehouse mug up three times a day you know it was more pleasant when young ladies came our way one day i was back on my boat when those pretty girls walked in decided to go join them forgot the open center bin fell face first in some brailers stored in that open hole. In my right hand, my coffee cup had not yet gotten cold. It didn't hurt my body, cut sore my dignity. But when I stood, that paper cup retained integrity. All the way, Bristol Bay, that's where I'll stay in the summertime fishing for the salmon. My friends cheered and applauded that beat as they stood by. But what vexed me most were the looks I saw in those young ladies' eyes. Ones of concern and laughter as my face burned bright red. I swore that in the future I'd watch where I did tread. I tell you now I broke that vow more than a couple of times. A foolish man I'll always be, that's why I write these rhymes all the way. Bristol Bay, that's where I'll stay in the summertime fishing for the salmon. In the summertime fishing for the salmon. Yep. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, pretty classic. Fisher poetry and song there, much, much appreciated um, coming in from the Kenai. Uh, thanks everybody for sticking around. We're all, we got two more sets. Um, I'm super excited to have 
Laura Messersmith Glavin here today from Portland or tonight, I suppose. Um, Laura grew up fishing in the Kodiak salmon fleet from the time she was two until 21. Now a writer, teacher, and coach, and coach based in Portland. Uh, her work spans the many places and lives she li she's lived since then, yet she always returns to the sea. I personally am super excited to announce also that she's got a book coming out, Spirit Things, a collection of essays, some of which uh, some longtime Fisher Poets attendees may have heard. Uh, that comes out in spring 2022. So thanks again. And you're on, Laura. Yay. Thank you so much, Alma. Um, you guys, this is the best. I love you all. It's so great to see you. Um, so the piece that I want to share tonight is not from that collection. I was looking for something short and I ran across something really old called The Elements of Sound. And when I was, when I was kind of going through figuring what I could excerpt, I was really struck by the end of this bit because when I was talking about one thing, it really felt like I was talking about the Fisher Poets. So I want to share with you a little, little tiny excerpt of that, that piece. Um, it's the section on water. This is not a poem. This is an essay on the physics of sound. Growing up in the Kodiak fleet, I slept in a bunk in the forecastle of a boat with my head roughly at the waterline. And at night, among the creaks of lines under tension and the talks and bangs of equipment moving with the swell, I'd hear the water lapping against the hull. It was a gentle sound, sometimes liquid, sometimes like the light slap of a palm, depending on where the boat got caught in a trough. It was so common, this water sound, and yet I found it both familiar and full of horror. Rather than a rhythmic lullaby, the tiny dips and peaks of the wavelets pattered out to me a constant reminder of the depths that lay beneath them. Abyss, they whispered, right here, inches away. Certain sounds are not about the transmission that creates them, but the receiver that gives them voice. Imagine that a drum talks not about the drummer, but about the skin with which it is made, the pitch and tone, the story it tells, is the skin itself speaking. The same patter on one head sounds different from another, so for me, the water speaking through the fiberglass of the hull did nothing to reassure me of the boat's seaworthiness. Instead, those gentle laps and droplets talked only about the thinness of the wall that separated me from it, the impossible depth that lay beyond. The sound of water moving gently is a different thing entirely from water moving fast or with force. On the beach of the Oregon coast, the restless waves crash and pull and sigh. Some find the sound relaxing, the thought that it never, ever stops, that it is there now, right now, smashing and dragging without pause, whether we are there to witness its movements or not. Sometimes this fills me with comfort, other times exhaustion. But this is what happens when water meets the world of the land and the sky. And what of the sounds below the surface Sound moves more quickly through water than through air, its speed depending upon pressure and temperature. As the water grows deeper, it generally grows colder. When sound waves slip through colder water, they slow, which refracts them downward, bending them ever deeper. They're at their slowest when they hit the thermocline layer where rapid changes in temperature occur, and below this layer, the pressure increases, which in turn increases the speed of the sound waves and refracts them upward. And in this way, the sound bounces back and forth as if trapped in a tube. These places in the ocean where sound waves bounce, refracting upward and down, encased by pressure, are known as sound channels. Like transatlantic telegraph tables, they allow for some under sound, underwater sounds like the song of a male humpback whale 
to travel thousands of miles without the signal losing strength. Did you know all male humpbacks within a region will sing similar songs? They copy and learn from one another. They borrow and riff and teach. Sometimes they sing choruses or duets. Distant communities may even pick up elements of other communities' songs through a form of cultural transmission. These songs range in length from six minutes to 30 and are often strung together in long chains, paragraphs, stories, sagas, refrains that are repeated for hours or even days. These songs demonstrate nested syntax, themes and subthemes, and a linguistic level of complexity and like human languages, they evolve over time. Researchers say that once a whale song has changed, it is never repeated again. Think of this, music and language, traveling thousands of miles, a tradition of storytelling and singing, of sharing, of changing over time, below the surface and above. The water is both music and medium, the drummer and the drum. Thanks, guys. I miss you. Oh, wow. Music and language, indeed. It's really been, uh, thank you, Laura, for that. Um, it's been a beautiful evening with you all and an honor to emcee it. Um, for those who don't know me, I am Elma, I'm the last performer here on this Friday night, but don't worry, there's one more night of Fisher Poets, it's tomorrow, um, again, it's beginning at 6 p.m. The workshops that I mentioned for tomorrow um, require pre-registration, so if any of those uh, piqued your interest, be sure to head to the website and register. Um, I also want to shout out that some of our Fisher poets typically sell work um, in the gear shack, and that's not an opportunity this year. So if you're interested in supporting your poets, um, check out some of their websites or follow them on social media or check out the In the Tote collection that Pat Dixon has really um, put blood, sweat and tears into online. That's also on the website. And finally, thanks to the organizers, John, Jay, uh, Florence, Amanda, Jamie, all the MCs. Uh, thanks for being here. I'll get to it and close us out and look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. I'm a Bristol Bay fisherman, typically. Uh, I live in Bellingham, Washington, like I said, on Lummi and Nooksack territory. I grew up on Pequot and Mohegan lands on in Long Island Sound. and um, Usually I cheat the system a little bit at Fisher Poets and read an essay, even though John Broderick elbows me to come up with some poetry. And the five minute limit really uh, reined me in this year, so that's good, but I do want to share some, tonight I'm just gonna share some, well, first I'm gonna share an essay title, which I really did get to writing this year, but it's not any good, so the five minute Mark gave me a good pass, but if you come back next year, you might hear it. The title is uh, One Man's Healing is One Octopus's Nightmare. What my octopus teacher says about the dangers of the male ego. You also might have to see the Netflix documentary to get what I'm getting at there, but uh, watch it and then maybe we'll get to that in 2022. But for now, in my little block, I have some poetry. I was super grateful to uh, share an evening of Fisher Poetry with Billy. Um, I had a lot of tough conversations with Billy uh, as she described this spring. And I also decided not to go back to Bristol Bay this summer following the tribal request that the fishery not happen. And I spent my summer back east on an oyster farm um, trying to learn to some unpatterning of white supremacist behavior in myself and decolonize my brain a little bit, which will be a lifelong process, I'm sure. Um, but my summer back east was full of swimming, which I found it's hot there. It's a very different climate than Alaska. And I found it to be a real balm. So this is one from this summer 
somehow I, in my little fishing inlet that I found near my parents' house, there happened, I happened to be in company with this older English, white man with an English accent. So that's who's in this with me. Dear Englishman on my swim, when your head goes under and your ears fill with water, eyes shut and lungs full of air, are you too wondering about abolition? Wondering if liberation feels even better than this, as good as this? If this, this feeling of buoyancy, lightness of water flowing gently through fingers and hair and in the mouth and out the mouth and under the suit and over the suit, if this feeling applied to laws, boardrooms, communities in cities, if that would be liberation, or are you simply wondering if there are sharks in here or what's for dinner? I tend to uh, write on my notes app a lot. Uh, inspiration is challenging to harvest at the right time. So I use my notes app a lot. And uh, in preparing for Fisher Poets, I had to do some old harvesting back there and I found a notes um, app that was just a running thing, but the title, the big block on my notes was Fisher Poets. So I worked that around and that's this one. Fisher Poets. <clears throat> Write the steam ladies poem. Write the sheer waters poem. Write the essay, beach peas. Is this the poem? How we peel off layers like the outgoing tide and reveal all that's underneath. How the birds traveled so, so far only to find the troughs empty and landed dead at our feet. Write the persuasive essay about how a boat speaker is more important than gasoline because the beach is willing to give up or sell a kicker can, but no one will give up their Wi-Fi to download Spotify playlists or lend out their loudest Bluetooth speaker. Write the personal essay about radio chatter and how it relates to feminism and communicating or over communicating because someone else needs to hear it. Someone likely younger or greener than you who is pulling the mic away before they're done speaking or doesn't know to how to blow it dry when it gargles. Is this the poem? I have one more. Um, my last summer that I did fish was 2019 and Ugashik had a super, uh, a super long wait. We had to sit in a really hot Bristol Bay summer and wait for the fish show, to show up for almost two weeks, which is unusual uh, for Bristol Bay. It's usually a high volume, very uh, sprint of a fishery. This is from that summer. My favorite flower is not the bright pink fireweed, but the dark purple beech pea, now already dried up in early July. Soon to be unfolding tight purple brown seed pods with eight or nine bumps a pop. They will dry there all summer. It's not until fall when they'll fall open, spilling seeds as swiftly as you might pour your morning cereal and unraveling as unnoticeably as your jacket zipper. No, instead in late July, we have my second favorite, the bright pink fireweed, so named for its swaths of color it paints on the green tundra so quickly and so brightly it echoes the fires of the peninsula in my winter home of Washington. Below these tall stalks of magenta pink, the beach pea has since shriveled up and left just purple brown pods. Purple brown like the bay at dusk and at dawn, they are as pregnant as the bay is heavy with salmon. The purple brown seed pods appear quietly like the river in those early weeks, finally empty of ice and still empty of salmon. They say the grass runs when the wind blows, blades shushing and slapping each other and anything nearby, buildings, boats, trucks, rain gear or sweatpants. The salmon appear to be waiting to run with the grass. 
so far this summer, the grass has kept quiet. Managing to walk, maybe jog, but struggling to break a sweat and up its speed. We, on the other hand, we fishermen run the beach more on still summers with a heat more familiar to the asphalt parking lots of your local Fred Meyer at home than the shallow rivers and bays of southwestern Alaska. We run more when the salmon don't. To replace our fears that the wind has forgotten how to blow and that the salmon have gotten lost, we create the movement ourselves. Without the wind, the grass is still, but under our feet is the familiar shushing of toes displacing sand. Between our legs is the unfamiliar slapping of blades, excuse me, between our legs is the familiar slapping of blades of grass. Under each step, a purple brown seed pod with an unknown future. Woo! Fisher Poets 2021 virtual Friday night set has come to a close. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, this event really nourishes me. I hope it nourished you tonight and can't wait to see you again tomorrow and then hopefully dance and uh, celebrate this industry with all of you for in person in 2022. Thanks again.